So, I'm going to do my best. Um, our chair, Mike, has uh, lost his voice, <laughs> so he is here, but I'm going to step up and um, use my voice to run the meeting and uh, do my best to, to fill those vocal cords or shoes, so to speak. <clears throat> so, it's as if I've never been to a meeting before because I'm nervous. Um, but we'll start with approving the agenda. Could I please add a liquor license for the wine vault and an outside consumption permit for Smuggler's Notch Distillery under consent agenda items? Wine vault, Smuggler's Notch Distillery. And Cabot Annex, those are the two, three then? Yeah. Any other changes? Then I'll take a motion to approve the agenda as amended. So moved. And a second? I'll second it. Anything further? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Agenda approved. Move on to the consent agenda. I'll move to uh, pass the consent agenda. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. <laughs> yes, sir. I should abstain because I'm on the consent agenda. Ah, okay. So, as make a note, Mike has abstained from that. And the consent agenda passes as amended. So we will move on to public comment, whether via Zoom or in person. This is a chance for the public to speak on anything that is not on the agenda. You will have a chance um, to speak on any agenda item when it does come up. And we are looking to limit comment to two minutes per person. Is there anyone in person or Zoom who'd like to speak at this time? Great. Seeing none, we will move forward ahead of schedule and hopefully keep this trend. Um, moving on to select board items. The first is uh, planning commission interviews. Sandy? Yes, ma'am. Um, Megan Noonan had to respectfully withdraw. Uh, She's a unique law clerk and um, was told by her supervisor that it's sort of a conflict. Oh. Mm -hmm. So she'll be free in September to volunteer for something then. Okay. So, Megan Newman has withdrawn, so we have Katie then today, Katie Gallagher. She's on Zoom. On Zoom, spectacular. Mm -hmm. And, Katie, if you would like to start and tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, and then we can move into some questions. Sounds perfect, thank you. Um, and thank you all for having me tonight. I wish I could be there with you in person, but I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak with you over Zoom. Um, so I live in Waterbury Center, right across the street from the Hope Davy Memorial Park. Um, my husband and I bought our home here in December, 2019. It was great for three months and then COVID hit, um, but we were just, really incredibly lucky um, to be able to find and afford a home at, at that point in time. And to be honest now would, would not be able to afford our home. So housing is, is a really personal issue um, for me. Uh, I previously lived in Burlington for about 10 years, um, but grew up in, in Connecticut on the shoreline. Another lovely place to be, but um, Grew up during a time when folks from New York and Boston were coming in and knocking things down and building their fourth home to come and live in for a week. And that really changed the character of the community in a, in a way that was pretty um, devastating to me. And I think that in part led to my professional choices, which have been mm -hmm. to follow um, uh, a line that is somewhat in the planning world or mostly in the planning world at this point, I guess. Um, so I currently direct the Sustainable Communities Program with Vermont Natural Resources Council, which is a uh, environmental nonprofit based in Montpelier. But for the past couple of years in my work as a planner, I focused on affordable housing, uh, sustainable transportation options, and placemaking. So how do we make the places 
um, especially our downtowns and villages, places where people want to live and be and and have their their businesses and so on. Um, and I guess the last thing I'll say before we move on to questions is that I also received my master's degree in community development and applied economics from the University of Vermont several years ago. Um, and for me, I chose that program specifically because I was interested in, in gaining a really um, as much of a well-rounded kind of education in both the community development side of things, but also the, the economic analysis um, side of things, which came from my previous experience in, in the policy world and um, understanding just how much the economics plays a part in all of the decisions that we, that we make. And so I was very fortunate to be able to, um, to pursue that. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. So we'll move to the select board. Anyone who has questions for Katie? Uh, Katie, this is Roger Clapp. Um, I was wondering, uh, are there any particular um, issues before the planning uh, commission that uh, attract your particular interest? Um, so I know that the, well, <laughs> there's, uh, several things, I guess I would say. One, um, in general, I know that the Planning Commission is working on the town plan and and hopefully trying to wrap that up. Um, that is something in general, I think that is, it is a huge task. Um, and so for me, while that is something I'm very interested in helping to support move, move along, I also understand there's been a lot of work that has gone into it at this point, and I hope that I would be able to um, help continue to push it down the path towards completion. Um, that said, there are um, things that I see as a Waterbury Center resident that I hope the Planning Commission would be interested in, in taking up in the future. I think that the center has really enormous potential and opportunity as both an economic and a residential hub. And um, that is definitely a priority for me that I would hope to uh, be able to work on in the future. Other questions? Katie, I've been in the construction industry for more than 40 years. Um, in my opinion, the word affordability ought to be stricken from the dictionary. I've, I've seen the construction industry morph into this uh, unaffordable avenue for a lot of people and I always hear about people wanting to get involved in solving these affordable issues outside of subsidizing which I, my belief is anytime you subsidize something it's a broken business model. Uh, trying to get back to the root of the problem is probably more critical in solving the issue than, than just throwing good money, you know, throwing money at it all the time. Um, I'd be curious to know, you know, as this board continues through the year, uh, what some of their suggestions might be as well as people like you as to how we're going to approach this thing and, and uh, you know, try to keep it affordable across the board. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I do agree that the word affordable has different meanings and there's, you know, capital A affordable subsidized housing and then there's affordable for everybody. And again, for, for me personally, I, my husband and I are, I would say middle of the road. We are very fortunate. Um, and we, we spent many years working, saving up, working to afford a house. We, we chose Waterbury specifically. Um, there was not very many houses on the market when we first looked and then we were, we, you know, <laughs> made the dive, bought our home. And then as you all know, there's pretty much nothing else in the past couple of years. Um, so we were very lucky in that way. What was affordable, our home at that point is no longer affordable for us. So when I talk about affordable housing, I do mean affordable for our, all folks. And that means homes um, of different sizes, different types, 
Um, so not just single family homes, but also apartments, both ownership and rental opportunities. Um, and one big way that the planning commission um, can help to address that is through um, making homes and housing density uh, an option. So in where I live, for example, we have uh, the house was a, had a um, an accessory, accessory dwelling unit at the back of our house that was built for their grandmother at the at the time. Um, so we are lucky that um, that we have that second unit already on our building or in our home, but we would not be able to in our current zoning structure add another unit, even though we also have a garage that would be able to, if we updated our septic, accommodate another unit. So that's one way um, that, that we would be able to help to make that incremental change to um, add additional units in a way that is uh, affordable, both for us as homeowners and small scale developers, um, and for the folks that we would then be renting those, those units out to. I mean, passive income has certainly been a driving force in the ability for certain people to own a home uh, mm -hmm. by renting portions of it out, uh, such as you're considering doing. Um, the, the trades, I mean, we could go on and on about this, but the trades, the trades industry is woefully lacking qualified help. Uh, I think that's also part of the problem. I mean, mm -hmm. My time in school was spent learning the trades and, and not other things. And fortunately for me, I was able to build, you know, several houses through my my life here in Waterbury at a considerable amount less than what most people would have to pay for it because they have to hire people to do it. And uh, I think that's certainly an avenue that should be pursued in the future as far as the trades industry is concerned, uh, getting more people the knowledge to do things themselves so they can, you know, save substantial money. So oh, yeah. I, I, yeah, we, uh, I applaud your efforts to, to try to help solve that problem. We have, uh, our home is, is, I think, 1825 old farmhouse. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, we're doing, well, <laughs> We renovated the entire downstairs ourselves over the past two years, and thankfully my, my husband is much handier than I am, but it is it is a ton of work, and now we're considering, well, we need to do the upstairs. We're considering hiring folks to do just like the sheetrock or do one, one part of it, and I'm just dreading going through that process because I know it's going to be probably more difficult trying to find workers than to just do it ourselves again. So I, I absolutely agree. Other questions for Katie? <laughs> <laughs> We're both handicapped. That needs to be <laughs> what is your opinion for uh, what is your opinion of environmental rights versus landowner rights? <laughs> oh boy. Uh, <laughs> That came from him. <laughs> you no, know, I work for VNRC. This is a hot topic. Um, so I, I think there is a, a delicate balance. And I think that we are very fortunate to live in a state that has long recognized that balance and where m most of the time we are um, starting off in a pretty good, good space already. I think... <laughs> uh, Landowner and property rights are incredibly important to the foundation of our culture and of our society. At the same time, we also know that certain environmental issues um, are also underpinning what make our businesses possible, which what make the town possible, which makes residences possible. If we were all to build in the middle of the forests up on the mountains, you're going to quickly, um, you know, run into some pretty big problems that would cost not only the town money, you're going to cost residents money. Um, and, and that cascades um, down and down. And also, not only, you know, physical environmental issues that we can face, or that we can feel, um, such as 
water quality, air quality, things of that nature, but also when we think about um, our impact on, on climate change. So it's, it's a very delicate balance. Um, and I think that that is probably one of the most um, challenging but pressing uh, questions in this point in time for me um, in my in my current work as someone who deals with sustainable land use is exactly that that question so I appreciate it and just knowing that you have limited time I'm going to try and leave it there and keep it keep it quick thank you anything else so, so Katie you probably know this but we do have another candidate um, at our next meeting so we won't be um, making any motions or decisions this evening but we're so thankful for your offer to to be of service to the town and then um, in two weeks we'll go through with the, the other candidate there are two positions two, open oh there are two positions We've open. had three candidates great so, yeah. spectacular so does that change what we're doing this evening um, that's entirely up to you um, that, so we can wait is, until the next. Is there just one position to fill? No, there's, there's two. two. I wish I didn't realize. We've got two candidates and two positions. <laughs> yeah. So we can move forward tonight if we'd like. Um, the preference of the board. I'll move that we uh, appoint Katie to the one of those positions. Um, so we get to pick one. There's Alyssa's position that is a remaining two-year term till April 30th of 2024, and there's an open seat to April 30th of 2025. Oh, did either of them put, do we just choose, or did either of them express interest in one or the other? Um, they, I don't think they knew that information. Yeah. She knew Preference. that information. Yeah. Um, Kitty, do you have a, did, were you able to hear those details, and did you have a preference for either of those? I would say I do not have a preference. I'd be happy either way. Do we want to wait and see if the other candidate has a preference then, no. since they're set different? So I, so I think we'll go ahead. Yeah. I thought we had three candidates, so I thought, so I I thought there was no, go to yeah. the next Same. meeting. So, okay. so we will wait. Then I can vote for meeting. meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to wait to appoint? We're going to wait to appoint. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. All right, moving along. So the next item on the agenda is revisiting the CV fiber request for appointing 75,000 to of, of ARPA funds so that we can so that um, matching funds can be applied for Mike originally wanted to revisit this tonight um, and keep it brief so I'm going to do my best to represent his uh, perspective and you can you know throw notes or, or whatever <laughs> it might do, it might work um, essentially I don't know if everyone was able to read the email today with documents that Linda sent out. It was just this afternoon, so chance, there's a chance you didn't see that just yet. Um, but it had some examples of, uh, of another town who has, done, has gone forward with this. Um, essentially, if it's possible tonight, in a brief conversation, what Mike thought is we could come up with the terms under which we would want to agree um, and then if we do agree on those terms, we would need to either finalize them to move forward or revisit next week if we were unable to agree on those terms in a timely manner this evening. Um, I think what Mike had in mind was uh, for the limitations being that it's, the funds are to be used only for the underserved um, households, I'll call them. And um, his suggestion was to use an income limit to be determined. And I don't know, I think that's gonna be potentially the hang up of the conversation. But was that the only, okay. So I will see if others have input at this point and then see how to proceed. <clears throat> Any thoughts, or have we, since our last conversation, has there been Well, any you know, as I said at the uh, last meeting last time we had this uh, on the agenda, which I think was the last meeting, mm -hmm. I do support uh, trying to get these underserved uh, households uh, connected, because I do think it's an important 
part of living in the 21st century. Um, my concern is really that we're trying to work within a fairly dynamic uh, uh, marketplace, uh, which has both the CV fiber uh, working along with Comcast, which is already fairly dominant in the town, and then uh, Consolidated, uh, which, uh, as I understand it, is coming forward fairly aggressively uh, and expanding with very uh, low rates uh, compared to Comcast. And uh, so in the interest of, of our constituents, I'm interested to hear if CV Fiber is uh, willing to collaborate with uh, Consolidated, which I believe is, is well ahead of, uh, of CV Fiber in terms of its plans to build out its system. I don't believe we have the authority to do that. We are a municipality and they are a public entity, a uh -huh. private company. Um, so. Um, Could you check on that? The, the, certainly, but um, mm -hmm. uh, in the planning and development the committee that I'm on, we had discussions about um, uh, the private, um, the public companies that are. Uh, available in the area, and mm -hmm. um, our charter has to do with uh, the underserved that they don't want. They don't want to serve, in other words. Mm -hmm. um, based upon the data of uh, a couple of years ago now, so even if they move forward with trying to serve those people, mm -hmm. um, our charter is based upon the data of two years ago. Yeah. Well. Again, my concern would be that uh, we would dedicate a certain amount of ARPA funding and then it would uh, potentially remain stranded if you determine that you are unable to build out your system uh, with the grant funds that you've got. And uh, Chris said last time we spoke that your system would not be sustainable without capturing some of those uh, clients, uh, customers, that are currently either with Comcast or, or could be with uh, Consolidated. So it seems to me like you're in a, a competitive situation, whether whether your, your charter I think spells good, out or not. I think it's a good thing to have competition in Waterbury. Um, and if we're driving down the prices for Waterbury residents due to our being there, um, I think that's a good thing too. And I, I'm curious if there has been any conversation about what would happen if, as Roger put it, funds end up stranded. So if we do delegate these funds um, and then down the line this is determined to be unreachable goal, what happens to that funding that we've approved? You can approved? specify that in your letter. That the money would come back to the town if the project is unable to be completed? Yes. Okay. I saw in the, the agreement. I saw in the agreement that uh, that's structured there, kind of a MOU between the town and CV Fiber that the town gets held harmless for litigation issues, but nothing to the effect of if the if the project isn't built out. So we would have to put that in. Put that in there. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is too. Bill had mentioned at a couple of prior meetings that. Uh, what are the possibilities of CV fiber building out the areas that aren't built out yet and having the two private companies that are currently dominant in this area bid on those those infrastructure packages uh, to see which one of those companies might be interested in taking on that since how they got no skin in the game well, for those build outs I'd like to give a, a quick update that might set this at rest. Mm -hmm. um, today, this week, we uh, received the delivery of our first fiber spool. Uh, we are starting construction, in other words, um, in our 21 members uh, of actually stringing fiber. We have hired an executive director um, and she started on the 11th 
Her name is uh, Janelle Smith. She has background in telecommunications. She is a Vermont attorney. Um, and um, sh she has worked with uh, telecommunications for a long time. She is taking over the reins of running the construction and the operations. We signed two contracts, um, with one with uh, Waitsfield Telecom uh, to start putting together marketing and operations of uh, our customers, and another with um, NRTC, which is a national construction of fiber company. They will be doing our design and construction, and um, they will be running the contractors. Um, I guess I see two possibilities of that might hold us up, and that is that there's going to be a, a huge demand for fiber optic cable, and we have put in orders enough to keep us uh, on track with several de deliveries between now and the end of the year. Um, and uh, through the state of Vermont, who has put together a co coalition of the CUDs buying fiber together. And the other is um, labor. There's a big demand on people who can um, do pole inventories and construction. And that's why we hired this NRTC company, because they are uh, one of the largest companies in, in the East Coast. And they have access and have been actually hiring more uh, construction people as they have been taking on more of these type contracts. I think this should put your fears at rest as to whether or not we are going to be successful in this venture um, because we have now hired on professionals to take over what the volunteers have been doing all along. So it sounds like what you're saying is that Whitfield Telecom will be the provider for all the 21 towns? Yes. Okay, so that it sounds, also sounds like it has to be a complete and total build out uh, no, it's coming in. Infrastructure. It's coming in in, in pieces, you might say. No, no, uh, we're I'm going saying, live in in pieces around. Yes, but I'm saying ultimately it's a complete and total build out of new in infrastructure in order yes. to. So there, there doesn't seem to be a way around. So you can make a contract with Woodfield Telecom, but you can't make a contract with Consolidated or Comcast. Uh, I, can you take your mask down, please? Just to it's okay to make a contract with Waitsfield Pelicom, yes. but it's not okay to make a contract with Consolidated they're, or... They're providing the service. They're not in competition. They're providing a service for us by... But you could ask Comcast to do the same thing, couldn't you? We got a better contract with them. But you have to build a they have whole an excellent rec okay, um, They have an um, excellent um, reputation um, for customer service, and that's one of the reasons we selected them. Mike have a question, but it's via writing. <laughs> <laughs> Mike says it's a good thing we have competition, but not via public funds. CV needs to take the risk for entire build out. How much for the Cabot example is underserved? Uh, Janelle Smith? She's, 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 she's the executive director, yeah. Um, was that a question about Cabot, or just because I, I don't? I'm not I'm sure about the question. With Cabot, besides the fact that they are just about as far along as Waterbury is with, and have put together this letter uh, that they are interested in pursuing, you know, the matching funds, and they want to um, work on the agreement. Um, and so, the MOU came about for Cabot and is being passed around to any towns that are getting close um, to, and it gives your lawyers a chance to work with ours to put your special touches or whatever you'd like to see into the agreement. So I guess, oh yeah. Cabot's really small compared to Waterbury. <laughs> right, I, mean, I don't know exactly. Disproportionately interested. But I, I can find out for you. Maybe to follow up from Mike's question, and this is more a statement than a question for you, Linda. My question is, I guess, alluding to Roger's previous things of orphan funds. <laughs> what was mm -hmm. he? I wrote it down. Uh, stranded. Um, 
I I'm feel like we have some consensus among a board of supporting underserved locations, potentially not campsites, but other single family homes that may not be served. The latest you sent us today had a different number for the per unit hookup cost, but I guess my concern would be if we're not supporting the general build out, I don't want to allocate more funding than is available to be used. So if it's 89 residences and we're going to assume not all 89 are going to meet whatever income criteria and it, you know, the proposed rate is $1,700 per household. I'm not sure that's getting us to the 75,000, which was, you know, an arbitrary 5% of Waterbury's ARPA funding. So I guess that's just to speak for myself personally, I think I would, in this letter it says CB Fiber will consult with the town of Cabot to determine how to best apply these funds within the town. I think we are, we seem to be tending towards a more restrictive um, use of funding within the town, so I would want to make sure there's adequate justification for whatever funding we would want to commit. I think that they are uh, going through an agreement process, mm -hmm. just like you are. The, the, the commitment letter just says that that's what they want to do. They want to make sure that their funds are going to go to the, the um, things that they're most interested in. And right. They, but yeah. they haven't decided exactly what those are either yet, but they right. want to make sure that they put in their offer for the uh, matching funds before it, you know, the limit, sure. the time limit. So, so I think Alyssa's point is actually to the board of we want to know that if we're not going to reach that 75000 by serving those underserved homes, we want to have a contingency use of those funds to make sure that we all agree on, on what those funds are being used for. So it seems at this point, I mean, the, the ask of us is simply, do we want to allocate these funds and what, if, if yes, what restrictions do we want to place on that? And if no, do we want to adjust the amount or not approve it at all? Um, my fear is that if we don't move in some direction, we'll just continue having this conversation at every meeting <laughs> forever. So um, I'm, I'm interested in hearing if there are any strong opinions of either moving forward with saying, yes, we want to do this, but let's decide on the restrictions next meeting, or if there are any motions that anyone has today. Well, by no f fault of yours, I suspect, this process has gotten to the point where, in my opinion, the town is, for lack of a better word, has been corralled into one option, which is this option of a complete build out with Wakefield Telecom as a provider, uh, and the ask has been 75,000. And I guess, to your point, we just need to decide whether or not that's justifiable and w will it be the final ask, or do you think that next year CB Fiber will come back? looking for more money possibly? It's possible. I, I'm not going to rule it out. Um, um, I don't see that the legislature has put up more funds yet for next year, for more matching funds, for example. But um, I did talk with a couple of people in the legislature who said they really want to encourage the towns to spend money on broadband. So I would not be surprised if more matching funds become available next year. But I, don't, I haven't heard of any yet, let's say that. We also can say, I think in the agreement, that it's a one-time agreement, if that's a concern that everybody shares. I think that's, that's valid. Or just leave it open and know that next year it might not be. So, so you just brought a good point. Maybe we say that it's a one-time based on the ARPA funds we already have. Mm -hmm. If in the future the state appropriates more ARPA, then we could reconsider that's a, that's an op that leaves an open option for them, but puts kind of a it can be in there. Stop. And also remember, even if it's not in there, we can still say no if it feels inappropriate in the future. You know, um, the one thing I do want to say is that you know we did some the, the former board, so three of us out of the five, did some work with equity with a facilitator, and we talked a lot about how we can view decisions with a lens of equity. And a lot of that had to do with racial and cultural backgrounds, but this applies as well. So I wanna think about how we can look at this decision with a lens of equity, knowing that just because someone lives on a certain road might be an assumption that they can afford or have a certain income, or because they have income can afford something, 
Um, but we know that there is a group of homes that are underserved. We know how essential, solid, good internet is for school children, students, college students, and people working. And so I just want to keep that in our mind as we go forward with this conversation. So Linda, is there a limit on, <coughs> I suppose it would have to be income based, there are certain people that live in areas here that are probably underserved that ultimately could probably afford a pretty good chunk of this investment, but wouldn't come forward unless they had to. Is there any carrot to try to coax some of those people to help pay part of the bill to get sections of their area done, as opposed to because Anybody else, I mean, I've had a couple of developments in my time that those res residents ultimately pooled together and bit the bullet to have that, um, that run to their, to their residents uh, with no help from anybody. And, uh, There are definitely, there's, there's I can people tell out there that can afford Yes, I was just going to say that. There are people out there. I drove through some of these areas and looked at some of these addresses that are on the, the list myself. And these houses, they look like they can afford to make their own connection. Then there are other ones that are, you can just tell when you drive up that there's not been maintenance done on this small house for a long time. And these people probably are having a hard time of it. Um, that doesn't give us much for equity, though. I mean, basically, um, the policy committee is looking into working with the other CUDs to put together a equity um, application. So that, and what they found was they did a, a test last summer, as a matter of fact. And what they found was that just getting people to apply mm -hmm. was a big deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that was um, I don't have internet now, why would I want it? You know, that kind of thing yeah. would happen. And at, at the same time, they had kids and they had to sit outside of uh, McDonald's to do their homework during the pandemic. Right. Um, and so um, it was taking like a one-on-one -on -one, um, to basically cajole the person oh, into, you, you would really love to have this. It would be a great thing for your life. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's not easy, in other words, to even get the people who are underserved, who we think of as underserved, um, to even step forward. Because that would bring down the, the uh, cost of the subscriber, ultimately, like you're asking the town to do by giving 75000 Your goal is to not borrow as much yes. and to bring down the subscription cost. Yes. For everyone. And that helps mm -hmm. in the equity margin of yes. this project. Um, Bill had a question also, I think. <laughs> yeah, so to kind of flip this on its head in terms of how, and I, I wish I had thought about this a couple of months ago now, but typically when the municipality is approached for use of public money, the people who are approaching, the organization that's approaching says, we would like to do this. Here's our proposal, and this is how much it's going to cost. And I think, Linda, and again, I apologize, I didn't think of this before. You and Chris and the whole CD Fiber board knows a whole lot more about this than any of us sitting around this table. And wouldn't it be better for you to come to us and say, Instead of, we want $75,000, which is 5% of your ARPA funds, and you can restrict it any way you want, why don't you tell us what you want to do? And that means we would like to run the fiber up these roads that don't have service now. Uh, we would like to run the fiber where there is a public highway up these driveways to these households that have incomes less than X, Y, Z. And, and then let us respond to it. Because I think asking us, or asking the select board, 
to figure out what the restrictions should be is is difficult. I don't think we have the I think, a, a, I think that's a just what term is, is we Cabot don't have the bandwidth this. to do that. Cabot is doing exactly what you said. They said we don't ex really know, we don't have the expertise. We want to work with you guys as you are going through our town um, to determine which ones uh, we should put our, uh, our funds to. And I think if you read their letter, that's kind of what the, the open restriction that they put in has to do with. And that's why I brought this sample, because I thought... To Bill's point, so I think he's saying that if it, if it came, we would be able to look at a budget and see see the funds, see what amount makes sense to us, and see what it's being allocated to, to versus agreeing up front and then figuring it out to have a plan in front of us where we could look at the budget and say, yes, this is where we want the funds to go, or let's strike this line item, you know, and then it'll be 55,000 versus 75. I guess I'm asking you to put funds aside, and as we come to Waterbury, you'll be able to look and say, okay, we don't want to do camps. We want to do these houses. These people, um, their property value is so low that they, we should ask, go and approach these people and uh, see if they would be interested and decide at that time, these are the people that we want to support with the ARPA funds. Um, by putting the funds aside now, you get the, the matching funds. Um, put a contingency in that says, if we don't use up all the funds, we would like it to go toward our design of Borderberry Network or um, the cabinet boxes that we have to put in town to make connections on the on the. Uh, so I guess that's the yeah, other option, is we can you know, okay we, the this, agreement without the restrictions this evening. So oh. Mike had a motion. <laughs> okay. oh. All right. <laughs> he says, I move, I move 75,000 K to CB fiber only for the underserved mileage with income restrictions to be determined only a one-time funding at this point. And as a reminder, we can second the motion and have further discussion. You can second it just to put it on the table for discussion. I'll second. Thanks. <laughs> Further discussion? Or does staff have concerns about going back on ARPA allocation or assuming that we take revenue loss, we could reshuffle? Or with just the process needed to get this agreement, which looks somewhat arduous? I don't, the revenue loss is what we're going to do. Yeah. And this works into that. This, this will not, approving this will not put us in a precarious Thank you. Other discussion before we take a vote? I'm just wondering if, if, if uh, the scenario that I started with came to pass, let's say just for sake of argument, that uh, CV Fiber gets to a point that, to, that determines that they cannot move forward with a sustainable plan to lay out fiber uh, to connect all these houses in Waterbury, uh, which is, I think, mm, mm, if not likely, uh, certainly conceivable. Uh, can we get this funding back? I guess my question is if, if, I think yes, we could put it in writing. If there's money there, we would get it back. I guess mm -hmm. the concern would be if the money, if the money's spent, you know, then do we end up in legal situation where we're trying to get money back from a municipality, which sounds not like a position we want to be in. So with that question being asked, I'm going to ask Linda another question. Is this build out in such a manner that portions are completed, that mm -hmm. the money that we give you, if it were spent, at least we've got a portion that are being served? Mm -hmm. Yes. As opposed to nobody? Yes, we are. Okay. We, um, I'm on the Planning and Development Committee. We have um, a project plan uh, that basically um, does by areas. And as the, each area is tested, it gets, they call lit, energized. energized. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, as soon as the testing is done and the, and the area is energized, 
we can actually take on subscribers right away. And that is trying to help with our sustainability. And we, um, mm. uh, Waitsfield Telecom knows that we will not be able, in the first, say, year of doing this, we will not be a sustain, a sustainable for all, because we won't have enough customers, we won't have enough lit areas yet, okay? But we see ourselves as, at, right now, having at least half of all our grant money th that we need to run this project, okay? So that means we should be able to get to a point to have enough sustainability, because it'll get us at least halfway through the three years that we anticipate this project running. We are also applying for more grants, by the way. Right, and I imagine there's going to be more coming down the pipe. Yeah. Okay. Other discussion? So, I would ask that they wait a second. Okay, sure. We're going to pause for a second. Call the question for both. Oh. I mean, Bill is, we're, no, we're waiting, call, Bill is, um, no, I'm no, reading Mike's paper, I'm reading Mike's paper, Mike, uh, Mike Mike yeah. we're Across waiting, Bill is wordsmithing what looks to be a motion, so we're just going to wait a second. <clears throat> My only concern is, should it be 50? I mean, I'm not, I'm not, just, I support the motion, I support if we want to do the allocation, but if, if we already don't have the cost to back it up, and 5% in my mind was arbitrary, and we have not done a holistic planning process for ARPA, which is what I would have liked to see. I don't know that I would start at 75, but I also don't have the expertise to pick a lower number. I mean, again, we got 1,600 per house connection on the latest. It was 1,750 on the earlier one, so. Um, uh, essentially. Just, okay. the or the horse. Uh, in, in, in the municipalities. Or even hours. like 50. I'm just saying if we're, if, if we're not sure how far we're getting, I don't know that I'd go to 75 to start. I might start with, uh, you know, we could do 25. We can get on board with CB5, but maybe we can look at matching. I, just I think all, the S uh, all these numbers of 1,600 and 1,750 are all estimates. Driveways are different lengths, in other words, and we try to figure out what I agree, what and that's driveways only, but the question is if we have 86 underserved homes, a third of them is 30, 30 times 2,000 yeah. houses, 60,000, and we're going to... Yeah. Allocate more than that before matching. Well, I put X. I know. I'm just. What do we got? Well, it will depend on the amount that we choose, but Sorry. with the wording, it says up to. So, um, with Bill's help, uh, well, a, re a revised motion. Do we need a vote on the old one to put a revised one, or can withdraw. we revise? Or he can withdraw. withdraw. Oh, maybe. Just withdraw. Just withdraw. 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 Okay. withdraw. 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 Can you withdraw your second? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is just for consideration. For consideration, and then if we are okay with it, we can move forward with it. A motion to appropriate up to X number of dollars to CV Fiber to be used exclusively in Waterbury to provide fiber optic service to unserved and underserved permanent residents, with the select board reserving the ability to review specific plans for Sorry, construction and connection. <laughs> and if we're okay with that, then we would just want to finalize that number up to, but I don't know how that would come into. Um, I'll uh, so move with that $50,000. <coughs> Is there a second? Any discussion? I can't read that way. <laughs> <laughs> We're making it happen. This is, you know, real life. I would like to just mention that Cabot is a lot smaller than water. Understood. Is one time oh. there? No. I is didn't one? Think of that. that doesn't say one time, does it? So we have more discussion over there? Yes. Um, Mike says there's nothing on income. Related in that right, I, I'm I'm personally okay with that. I think that's um, it can be arbitrary and doesn't tell the whole story and doesn't for me serve an equitable decision. But I'm okay if, if it's an open discussion to that. If others want that to be a part of the, it does say. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it we says, can review the term. It says unserved and underserved permanent residents. So there's got to be a definition. That we have that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And then you get to review the specific plans for construction and connection. So that means we can you get to see that it's going up. It's going to that right now. It's going to that one. Yeah. Yeah. I think it gives you the flexibility that you're looking for to be able to ask questions to say, we don't really think that it's our job to do this or it makes a lot of sense to do that. You don't suppose anybody cry foul on something like that? Well, they cry foul all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I think if they saw the arduous discussion we've had in this decision making, they would know we have the best interest of the town at heart. So it has been moved and seconded? Yes. Further discussion? Okay. Those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. If you would like to move forward. Yes. We need a letter similar to what mm -hmm. we have it on your letterhead. And that opens negotiations <laughs> between basically your lawyers and our lawyers to put together an agreement. Do we have to have a lawyer? No. <laughs> There's There's the money. There's the other right there. So what do you need from us to ensure things move forward? Well, do I'll take a copy I'll take of that. that. Okay. And what I'll do, I assume you're looking at me to write this letter, so I'll write a letter. I'm happy to help draft this if you don't. I'll, I, okay. I can write it and I can circulate it. Okay. And uh, I'll go from there. We can come back. And you know, I'll send it to each of you. I'll send it out all together. But then, when you respond <laughs> one at a time, respond to me, please. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank I would like to that. thank everyone thanks for their for consideration that. of doing this for the residents of Waterbury. Thank, thank you for your effort over here. All thank you. All right. And Adam, I would love to come and keep you abreast of what's happening. Please do. Yes, and you can always send stuff electronically as well. Well, so keep I can. on top. Thank you. <laughs> I will. All right. Spectacular. We are slightly behind, but not too terribly. So we're going to move on um, to the last item under select board items, which is the letter of support for the Worcester cell tower issue. Um, so I think every did everyone receive an email about the issue? And um, what's the best way to move forward? Do you want uh, separately? Of course, we did not discuss it under it. Um, so essentially, Worcester, the beginning of the letter sums it up. Worcester received word that Industrial Wireless Technologies, a mass firm, leased land and was preparing to build a tower at the top of Norton Road in Worcester. The proposed tower is 20 stories high to be built 300 feet from a neighbor's home. The town had no warning in advance of the plan. Um, so this is a similar situation as to what happened in Waterbury. I cannot remember the year. So yes, I was clearly not here yet. Um, and the ask is to the Select Board of Waterbury to um, sign a letter of support for the town of Worcester and their opposition to the proposal for the cell tower on Norton Road. Um, there are some restrictions at the bottom of the letter. So I'm not sure if there are questions, concerns, or Who's clarifications. Asking? Who do the requests come from, Mike? Um, Eric, don't the name's long. Oh, yeah. It's at the bottom. Um, uh, my question would be, can we talk to Steve? I mean, I would just say, as a planning commission member, we do get received notice of, and again, I was not here for the North Hills Salt Tower. I know it was quite a saga. Um, but as a planning commission member, we did receive notice of, I think, the new location of it. Um, and the town has party status through the planning commission. And so I'm a little unclear what our grounding is to comment on matters in other municipalities and i would love to hear from steve who we just reappointed to be our rep to the regional planning commission not to put you on the spot steve, no, but uh if but you're to willing to share that. um yeah like i said i wouldn't feel comfortable um again mike just i did not talk with the gentleman mike just forwarded in exchange so i just before before writing planning support letters on behalf of other municipalities i would want to know um, what your perspective is. Yeah, yeah well, I, I'll just uh, say briefly that uh, normally there's a requirement for a 45 day notice to the municipality 
for any uh, major applications to the Public Utility Commission. Uh, and that would include for cell towers. We had one for a tower that is now proposed between Greg Hill Road and Route 100. And, um, and then that gives the opportunity for the, uh, the select board and the planning commission in the town to, um, you know, to comment on, it's an, a 45 day notice in advance of the application. I'm not sure if that's what precipitated this letter. Um, mm. And then the full application would come in. So um, I know enough to be dangerous about this uh, town. I've heard about it. It's come up at the Regional Planning Commission level. But um, I don't think we have party status. Um, and um, I don't have a lot more information than what you, what you just heard about. Uh, as far as this particular project, I know it's, it's extremely uh, tall tower. And I know there's opposition. but. Beyond that, I don't really have details for you. Thanks. I guess just my follow-up with the question is, again, I'm just reading this email from Mike, which I'll hand to Steve in a minute, but it says, the Select Board of Waterbury, Vermont, supports the town of Worcester and its opposition to the proposal for a cell tower. As telecommunications develop in our state, several restrictions must be observed. Town select boards and planning commissions must be involved in the siting process before locations are determined. Is that happening to any extent in the state it's all, currently? It's all no. contrary to law. Uh, so the, the Act 248 cuts municipalities out Understood. of this process. So this is. So that's what they're arguing. So is they want they're our saying support they in must be, and it would be nice if they were, but that but it would be better addressed to the legislature than to, right. to the town of Worcester. Um, on number three, and again, we we fought against uh, was it Verizon? Yeah, Verizon, correct. We yes. fought against the Verizon's <coughs> cell tower in uh, Waterbury, and what we were fortunate to have in going for us was that it was in uh, this uh, natural area that the state had deemed to be somewhat um, sensitive ecologically and for wildlife habitat. And uh, we ended up prevailing, um, but frankly only because Verizon was unwilling to move the tower about you know, 100 feet. If they had just moved it down the hill, I, I'm pretty sure we would have lost. And number three that they have written here, um, the public good, not the developer's product, profit must remain paramount and the town governments must guide this. I don't necessarily disagree with that, but the reason why municipalities don't have um, the ability to, um, to review these projects is for the public good because no one wants it in their backyard. Mm -hmm. And if every town had the ability to say, no, we don't want this here, it doesn't work for us, then there would be none. And this is a hard concept. And I, I'm not against sending a letter to Worcester saying this sounds excessive, 300 feet or whatever it is, seems pretty odd. But I just want you to all understand that there are a lot of things that the public uh, relies upon in terms of modern life that if you allow towns to have the say, there wouldn't be any of them, you know, landfills. Uh, if every town could say, we don't want a landfill, then what do we do? So, so I probably should have read the whole letter. So it looks like, Steve, they are going through the process that you just outlined, because it says the select board is unanimously opposed, the planning commission is unanimously opposed, and the citizenry is <coughs> overwhelmingly opposed. And they, they're asking for the letter, and I think to send to state regulators, which is what? it looks like here. So um, yeah, if we do want to show support, then we would maybe want to revisit that, the letter, the template that they sent. One of the, one of the aces that we held in our hand as a municipality was in our municipal plan, we had stated that there was to be no cell towers or communication towers of any sort, if I remember correctly, in those critical wildlife habitat areas. That was 
So we were following, we were fighting for what we had adopted as a town plan. Uh, I had talked a little bit with Mike about this letter because that's the first thing I said, we shouldn't be sticking our nose in other people's business. Um, my biggest rub uh, for the cell tower issue wasn't the fact that it was the cell tower, it was more the fact that uh, a landowner was going to pursue residential building using the infrastructure that the cell tower company was going to install in that area. And being a critical wildlife habitat, the cell tower was nothing. The cell tower just stands there and you might get a visit once a month from a crew inspecting it. It was more the residential build out that could take place afterwards that would have really impacted the wildlife corridor. That was my bigger rub. <coughs> and that, st that issue still exists potential issues still exist even though the cell tower didn't go in. And to Bill's point, he's right. We all want good cell service, but damn if you're gonna put it on my hill <coughs> or the neighbor's hill, you know. So this is from a member of the Worcester Select Board. Did you have something to add? <laughs> Just real briefly. They basically want to do Verizon says you're doing it our way, no no options. And that's where what Worcester's not so totally unopposed, but they want to look at options. And that's the same thing that happened in Waterbury. There was the Verizon said, no, we want it here, no options. And you know, this is a big, you know, a two hundred and plus foot tower. It's not it's a lot smaller than so I have a lot of sympathy, and I agree with what Bill said. I'll shut up. So would we want to, do we, I guess the, the options are to not send a letter or to revise the template sent to show support or to get more information before we decide either way. I don't know. I mean, do you think they're looking for our support because we haven't been in our case? And it might have some leverage in court. Is that why they're I assume they're getting as many letters of support as possible just to yeah. show like mass, you know. Yeah. That's like what you do when you That's why he contacted me because he said Waterbury. You've been through it. Mm -hmm. Results. And we're in adjacent town too. Mm -hmm. So that's right. And we're just over, but, over the radio. But there's no requirement for adjacent towns to be notified even. So right. this is uh, really a battle that the town of Worcester needs to take up with the through the Public Utility Commission. I think when they talk about state regulators, I think they're talking about the Public Utility Commission. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, our case, I forget, we spent $60,000, $70,000, mm -hmm. I believe, on that. And we prevailed, uh, fortunately for us, the state of Vermont Agency of Natural Resources decided to fight it as well. And they had their lawyer um, that, that did a lot of the legwork that saved us considerable money. Um, the challenge for writing a letter is, unless you're just gonna say a town should have the ability to veto this, I'm not sure what what you can really say. You know, we, we don't have the information uh, about this, so. And we don't know what's in their municipal plan, even if they have them. Could it's you write saying. to John and just get more details? Yeah. To me, the town needs to say they need to go back to Verizon. What are the practical alternatives mm -hmm. to do what you're doing? They, they basically said, it's, this is this And I understand what Bill says, we need cell service, but if it's in a bad location and everyone in that town is really opposed to this, and I don't think it's totally a, I don't like the NBAism, but it creates, it creates an issue. 
Yeah, the town of Worcester can demonstrate that there's an alter alternate site or a co-location site, you know, they, they may have a case. So I think every case is so nuanced and towns have been successful. Cabot, I think, was successful in getting a tower moved to a co-location site. So I think um, we can be supportive, but writing a letter to me is, is a, um, maybe not an appropriate role at this point. But we can probably get a copy of the application or the 45-day the notice. It may even be public information. Okay, so we'll take no action at this point, and then if you want to have more conversation with John. And one other point, I don't know if you've already spoken to, what is that, now I get three emails a week, um, Gwen and Karen at VLCT, they think yeah. all the VLCT advocates, and they're certainly more versed in making public campaigns than I feel, I or we, even as a board bar. Um, so if he hasn't already done that. Thanks for your help with that, Steve. Oh yeah, you're very welcome. Yeah. All right, we are going to move on to the joint meeting with our FUD commissioners. And they're all here one way or the other. We have what? They're all here one way or the other. Great, we have everybody. Do you want to come on up to the table? EFUD commissioners? Oh, we're okay here. Oh, you're okay? Okay. Natalie, you can come up if you want. Come on over. I don't think the owl will pick you up from back here, by the way, if you want to be a little closer. They can hear me. Okay. Um, um, if, if on Zoom, if you can't hear, let us know. I need to call the meeting of the Edward Ferrar Utility District to order for a joint meeting with the select board on April 18, 2002. And we have with us here uh, myself, Skip Landers, Lefty say uh, Natalie Sherman and Cindy Parks and uh, Bob Fanukin is on the Zoom uh, screen here. And uh, we're here to talk about uh, four items on the uh, agenda, the Stowe Street Bridge Project update, the manager search uh, committee items, which include four things that we want to uh, talk about the service agreement, having alternates, the open meeting law, and uh, the number of members of the committee, and also a uh, MOU with uh, EFOOT regarding uh, potential transfer of properties to the town and to review the RFP for the recreation master planning, which includes some uh, EFOOT property at the moment. So. Um, can we check with someone on Zoom if that's audible just before? So with that, you can uh, continue on with your agenda as appropriate there. Okay, I'm not sure who's leading. Oh, excellent, thank you. Well, Hi. I've got uh, assistance on Zoom. Ooh, so so um, Tom Knight <laughs> is our consulting engineer from Stantec. He's on, he'll be sharing a screen if he's got privileges. And he'll probably lead us through most of this and I'll jump in and maybe talk over him occasionally. Sorry, Tom. <laughs> and then um, I also want to introduce Mahendra Villiar. He is a VTrans project manager and he will actually be taking over this project for me because I will be departing VTrans in a couple of weeks. <laughs> so he also is managing the, uh, the bridge project on Route 2 over the Little River. So he'll probably be in touch with you guys if he hasn't already. Um, so he'll have two water bridge projects that he is managing. So we'll have some continuity there. But with that, I, I guess uh, if Tom, you're able to share, maybe you can kick it off. <coughs> and we'll keep this as uh, quick as we can so we can get to the questions so we can hopefully recover some agenda time for you guys. <laughs> Very sensitive, thank you. <laughs> right. All right, we can see this, Tom. Yeah, are you seeing that thing? Yeah. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. All right, um, thanks for having us back. Um, I think, one of the points we wanted to make here, John, was that with, with your um, of project managers within VTrans, um, you know, Santec's happy to be here as the consistent member on the team. Um, I've actually been working on this this bridge off and on since about 2005, and um, hopefully that familiarity with the town and familiarity with the project serves us well moving forward. Um, 
here we are in the product development process. John, did you want to say? Yeah, so last time we were here, we were in project definition, kind of scoping, selecting alternatives. Um, so now we're farther along, we've gone through our conceptual design, we're in the preliminary design, and we've really kind of identified all of the constraints of the project, and we want to give you guys an update and really talk about conflicts, which we'll, we have some slides on. Um, but we're moving forward through design and ultimately towards that contract, active contract phase. Okay, just to refresh, the, the recommended alternative here um, is for a structure bridge to replace the existing bridge. Um, and I've got some pictures that describe that a little, a little better. Um, when, we were, when we were presented the alternatives to the town back in the summer, um, we, were, we were, knew we were gonna be looking for a 60 day closure of Stowe Street. And we knew we'd have some potential impacts on Lincoln Street traffic. And that's one of the main points we wanna update on today. So a, re a refresh of what that project looks like. This is an um, aerial view that we showed during the um, alternatives presentation meeting. And just to orient everyone, you know, here's Thatcher Brook flowing from on the page to the top of the page. North is oriented somewhat to the right here. Um, this is this is Stowe Street, and this is Lincoln Street. You, you can see my cursor there. Um, so as you can see, we're, we're talking about adding a right-hand turn lane on Stowe Street. Um, there'll be a, a left-hand and through lane coming off the street onto Vermont 100, um, as well as the, the single lane accessing from Vermont 100 onto Stowe Street. This is... What we're showing here is the buried structure. This is an arc type structure um, from, from the actual road surface. You're not gonna see much of the, of the bridge. Um, we, we did this three-dimensional rendering at the time of the alternatives presentation to explain what that looks like in like kind of a cutaway view. Um, basically it's gonna be a, the street and roadway built on top of the arch. Um, there's a relocated sewer line that's gonna be within the fill of, of Stowe Street. And we've done a little more work since then, um, taking this three-dimensional artist rendering and, and this, this plan view drawing, and we actually have a three-dimensional model now with a lot more accuracy to it, um, accuracy and dimensions to it. And one of the, one of the things that we put this together for was to demonstrate when we build this structure, we're going we're gonna to have a big hole dug out on um, Stowe Street. And the limits of that hole are, are becoming better, well, more, more well-defined as we progress with the design. But as you can see, the, the edge of that hole that we dig here is kind of eating into the corner of Lincoln Street and the end, of Stowe, the end of Stowe Street. And that's gonna limit the amount of room we have to do the construction and ultimately it's gonna limit the traffic that we can maintain on Lincoln Street during the construction process. I'm gonna to flip to the next slide. Um, so again, rep representing that same hole in the ground here, we have a, a brown shape looking down on the, on the site now. And these lines would be the finished edges of Lincoln Street you can see this area is going to be occupied by equipment for a good portion of the, the project construction. Um, ultimately, what that means is we, we'd like to detour traffic away from this area, prevent, prevent link, close Lincoln Street for 21 days for construction. Yeah, and I'd like to elaborate that, you know, um, while there's physically space to make that pass through there, you'll see on the slide here, we're only recommending that that closure would apply to emergency service vehicles for a shorter duration, because when the contractor is doing excavation or backfilling, um, those pieces of equipment can get out of the way relatively quickly for an emergency service vehicle. 
um, when they're in this configuration as shown on the screen here with the crane, that there's a lot more setup and breakdown time there, so it would be inaccessible to emergency services. Um, we have already held a meeting with the emergency service providers <coughs> to let them know about this plan, and they are comfortable with what we were proposing. Um, but effectively, what we're proposing, 21 days for the Lincoln Street closure, allows the contractor to basically have free and unrestricted access to the site to make that excavation, place that uh, cast in place footing, erect the precast, and do the backfill uh, without having to try and maintain traffic through Lincoln Street. And even if they do maintain traffic, it's still gonna queue up substantially um, as they hold traffic for their equipment to get loaded and unloaded. So there's going to be a time conflict um, either way, and, and ultimately, there are activities which traffic cannot be maintained, such as the installation of the precast structure. So, um, you know, our proposal for 21 days we feel is the safest to uh, keep traffic away from an open cut, uh, keep the site clear for the contractor to have unfettered access to the site, um, which gives them a better chance of being successful in the overall schedule um, to deliver this. So we are still, you know, planning for construction year 2025. So there's plenty of time to plan accordingly, to notify people, to outreach these activities. Um, and, and we're really hopeful that, you know, with, with this 21 days that this will be, you know, a really high quality and executable contract. What happens to the households that are right on that corner? So uh, everybody that is on the Lincoln Street side would be detoured around. So we've got Justin back here who's probably gonna get the worst case detour. <laughs> um, and they, we still have to maintain access to their driveways. So their driveways would be open from the Lincoln Street side, but they, the, there wouldn't be access through the site back on the Stoke Street. So it's up Perry? The okay, detour would be up around. Up Perry Hill and around. Yeah, it's like a 10 minute drive around from end to end. Just don't do the project during the season. I was going to say. Yeah, that's going to be. What about one, stay at home or one time of year that we don't want to do this. And hey. there's no pedestrian access either. Like, could, could they walk from Lincoln so Street to Stoke Street? We should be able to maintain, and Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, but we should be able to maintain pedestrian access around Lincoln Street and Stoke Street, but there will be no pedestrian access across. Right. The Stoke Street Bridge to 100. Mm -hmm. um, and another, I think, important note here is that um, in preparation for this, we also executed an MOU, and I'm jumping the gun a little bit, Tom, uh, with BGS to relocate the park and ride facility to the state complex, um, not just for that closure, but for the entire duration of the construction contract to reduce the number of trip tra uh, traffic trips that have to go through there. Um, and so we've already executed that agreement. Uh, BGS is amenable to it. The next step would be to coordinate with the transit authorities to um, make them aware of that and update their routing, their preference in routing. Uh, one other thing I didn't mention and we haven't talked about it also is um, the uh, municipal uh, facilities. Obviously, sewer will have to be bypass routed around that open cut. And then um, the water line in Lincoln Street is in the proposed excavation so that would have to be relocated farther away from the excavation limits prior to the closure of the bridge so there would be some traffic impacts to lincoln street um, to relocate some infrastructure prior to the closure even starting and is there going to be any improvement uh, in access to lincoln street uh, coming off of stowe street you know Particularly when those buses come in to the park and ride. Uh, Absolutely. It's a challenge. Tom, can you show that layout uh, again that has the, the lanes? Yeah. So right. right there. And you can see Tom's cursor on the corner there. There's a flare. So yep. the, the advantage of a buried structure versus a new bridge is that um, you basically get to fill it in. So the earth flow, you can regrade that whole area. So it, we're able to facilitate that curve versus if we'd done you know, a traditional bridge with beams and girders, we'd have had to put a oh, kicker in. Yeah, and so, so, oh, mm -hmm. fucker. Oh. oh, that's gonna be huge. Glenn, can you mute yourself, please? <laughs> oh, whoops, my bad, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, substantially funny. larger turning radiuses for, for buses for that park and ride facility. <laughs> Again, apologies. <laughs> 
and that's a, there's a typical section on this sheet too. So um, where currently there is no um, shoulder, the new structure will have four foot shoulders. Um, and then the sidewalk is actually changing size of the bridge and that'll be carried all the way down to the North Street intersection, which also provides some connectivity to Lincoln Street, which currently there isn't because it's mm -hmm. on the other side. Yeah. So the bigger question is between now and the time this project's done with costs being what they are, uh, I forget, was it four million original? I, right now our current estimate is about $4 million. Uh, I think that it has about $680,000 in engineering, for preliminary engineering, um, and then uh, I believe 50,000 in right-of-way acquisitions, and then um, the remainder are in construction and construction engineering contingencies. That does consider a 20% escalation from our bid history. However, what we're seeing in our bids are 50%. So it's low by the bid openings that we're getting right now. Not sure what that trend will be in three years. It could continue on up. Hopefully, you know, um, hopefully we'll get some, some ramp up in production of materials, some ramp up in labor, and we'll get a leveling off. Uh, or the flip side of that is people will stop building stuff because the costs have gotten so high, so then we'll have enough labor and materials to build what people are actually producing still. So hopefully they'll level off, but right now, I believe our estimates are low, um, probably by about a half a million, um, based on what we're seeing for trends from the spring's bid openings. You mean it's conservative. <laughs> well, we already, put a, we already put a large increase on it to try and capture that, and it wasn't large enough. So... Um, and I believe on this project, the town shares 5% of total costs because we're closing the road. So um, we've got 80% federal funding. We typically have a 10% town funding and a 10% state, but with Act uh, 53, 153, we were able to reduce the town share in half by closing mm -hmm. the road. So by closing um, Stowe Street for this construction, the town share went to 5%. Mm -hmm. The other five goes to the state or where? The state picks up the other five and the feds continue with their, their 80%. Um, there are some, some opportunities in the funding right now from some of the, some of the new legislation coming out. Uh, mm -hmm. The Federal Highway will be picking up 100% construction costs for municipal projects. Um, they haven't picked which projects are gonna get those, but this one is on that list right now, but there's no guarantee that that'll happen because it still hasn't actually been approved yet. Um, so there is a plausibility that the town would only be paying for the 5% of the engineering and the right-of-way acquisitions. Which is change? Uh, the engineering costs uh, and acquisition costs would be a, a little over $700,000. Do you have geotech engineers working on this or civil engineers who think they're geotech? We have all sorts of engineers working on this. So we do have geotech. For those of you who, um, that's probably a good another talking point. Uh, later this week, there will be drill crews out there on site for the third time. Uh, we've got a lot of variability in the ledge. And as we advance the design, um, we recognize that we needed to get more information because we've got a 60 day bridge closure period and we've got prefabricated elements that are already built to fit. So we really need to understand what we're putting them on. So the drill crew will be out there at the end of this week, either Thursday or Friday. Um, they'll be behind the guardrail. They shouldn't be interrupting traffic at all. And then on Monday next week, um, there will be a brief interruption to traffic in the morning when um, the town forces are gonna pull the guardrail to get the drillers in behind the guardrail. So that's occurring next week. Um, but we have a substantial geotechnical effort from geotechnical engineers on this project. There's blue clay very close to that. That's why I asked the question. We're going all the way to bedrock. So we're going right to the bottom. <laughs> can, can I offer some comments? Is that your name? Yes, Al Lewis. Oh, hi Al. <laughs> I've lived, you I've lived on Curry house. Hill going on 50 years, so I don't know how many times I've passed through that intersection getting onto Route 100. If you could put the slide up that shows the bridge, the traffic across the bridge, can I point out a couple of things? Yeah, sure. I've, I've given comments to Bill Woodruff, by the way, and I advocate for the town to have Bill present those to the state because some of it deals with what the state might, might need to do. But um, on this drawing here, 
I believe we got your comments last week. Um, we actually took a look through those, and we are going to adopt some of them. There are some that are a little out of scope for what we're doing on the project, yep. but we are adopting some, like moving the stop bar up. I think that was one of your comments uh, on yep. Stowe I, Street. I, I will I'll back off, and I will. You're more than welcome to bring everybody up, but if you want, we can, once we finish resolving um, our response to your comments, we're going to give it back I, to Bill. I just would like the town to make sure that Bill Woodruff has enough backing in order to force some of these changes, because this bridge, yes, there's improvements that are made to the bridge, but there needs to be improvements at the whole intersection. And that whole intersection improved, actually the improvements on the intersection, a lot of it can be made with simple line changes. And that's the same thing with Blush Hill, traffic coming down on Blush Hill, and going across on, just briefly, just a little thing like bringing this stop bar out here. If you watch the traffic today, the way everybody works, the traffic stops here, even though there's only room for one. Stops here, yeah. and the other cars <laughs> go over here so they can see. They can see traffic coming down on Route 100. So little things like that, um, yeah, and that is one of your comments that we are going to include in the final design. So okay. that's one that we accepted as makes a lot of sense and we're definitely doing it. Um, there are some others that well, I think they make a lot of sense. We weren't going to adopt this part of this project because it's a town highway bridge project and it's yep. got town funds and it's a kind of a state owned intersection. So I was I sent those to my traffic engineering division um, and I don't have a response from them yet. But once I get information, we can well, I'll circle back with Bill and yourself and also this board. Um, as to what we will do or can do and what we are not doing and, and why. Okay. If that makes sense. I guess sense. I just want to advocate for having support Bill in this because when the, when the Route 100 project was being done, they said it was too late to make any changes. Simple changes like moving a line that they put in the road. Mm -hmm. No, nope, we can't do that. I recognize that, but now might be the, the, the opportunity really to fix that whole intersection. I drive through that intersection every day also. I live on Blush Hill, so uh, I'm on board. <laughs> I'll do what I can. <laughs> well, it's painful to sit there yeah. and watch the white and the yellow license plates go through the red light because you know, they're impatient, and then they're sitting on the intersection, and you want to get out because you've got only a few minutes in order to make it onto Route 100. So it, there's, there's things that can be done that I think can make a big, bigger tool. Thanks, Thanks. Uh, Thank you. Jane had her hand up. I don't know if it still is. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm Jane Brown. I was on the select board for five years. And during that time, can you hear me okay? Uh, no. Echo. Is that any better? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Um, during the time I was on the select board, we, I was on a um, subcommittee, I guess, with the town planner, Steve Lots Beach, we had a we had a um, scoping report done for uh, pedestrian and, and sidewalk and bike improvements, but primarily sidewalk from this intersection with Route 100 uh, here on Stowe Street up to Colbyville, past Shaw's, and. It's a tricky one for pedestrians. And I see, you know, you've moved the sidewalk from one side of Stowe Street to the other, and it works beautifully with getting that sidewalk, uh, wrapping it around the intersection of Route 100 up to, towards the mobile station. But it doesn't do anything for um, the neighborhood or the people that live on Blush Hill. Um, there is a school nearby in the village of Waterbury, as you know, on Stowe Street. And there's a neighborhood up in Blush Hill with people that may want to walk across Route 100. It seems like you've made it more difficult to make the rationale for uh, a landing on both sides of, uh, of Stowe Street to cross Route 100. What do you what are your thoughts on this? I didn't see this earlier, so I haven't written any comments. But um, another issue when when Route 100 was paved, it was noted that it would be a lot easier for bicyclists to come down Route 100 and just turn down Stowe Street and take that to get down to Waterbury rather than stay on Route 100 and cross the interstate. 
and that's not that's more tricky business so um i think you've solved some problems but i want to know you know what this about what your thoughts are and tom you can correct me if i'm wrong but i believe we terminated that sidewalk as outlined in that scoping study right that that scoping study recommended crossing route 100 at that location so we are taking the bridge project and the sidewalk to it's a lot like a logical termination within the confines of a town highway bridge project um and it would be up to any subsequent future projects that we're going to construct the rest of that facility to tie in but so we, why have you heard, we followed the scoping study um as far as where we okay we so uh, it's been a couple of years. Did the scoping study remove the sidewalk on the other side of Show Street then? Yeah. Maybe I yeah, the have recommendation was to include the sidewalk on the on the upstream. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know yeah. how anyone's ever going to cross Route 100, but. Well, we have a bicycle and pedestrian grant right project that includes a, a crosswalk there at the termination of the sidewalk that shows over to the Blush Hill Road side, and then a sidewalk that continues up to the Exxon station. So that project has been funded. It's on hold until the bridge gets reconstructed. So uh, Santec was involved, and Tom, you may uh, have, he's cir Tom circling where the a crosswalk will be. The uh, VTrans would not approve a crosswalk on Stowe Street at Route 100. So that brought the sidewalk to the north side of the bridge. And once the bridge is constructed, then we can move ahead with the bike head project to create that crosswalk. All right, thank you for refreshing my memory on that. Is Tom, oh, uh, does that Tom have a hand up? Yeah. Yeah, um, just a quick question. A lot of people walk to work at Shaw's up Stowe Street, and a lot of people walk for their groceries. So that's a significant hardship. They'll have to go downtown Waterbury. And I don't know how the people will get to work, but has there been any consideration of a temporary footbridge across the river, say, even from the park and ride? just to create a path that people can get over there. We discussed that at the original. Correct. We discussed it heavily at the original scoping or the original scoping presentation about how that any construction of a new bridge actually wipes out the Act 153 funding or the town share reduction of share. So while it wouldn't be included as part of the project necessarily, it wouldn't preclude the town from using the money that they've saved to put something in that's temporary. Um, one advantage of relocating the park and ride though, is that um, there is, you know, bus connectivity downtown and hopefully, um, and we haven't taken this upon ourselves yet, but it is on action end for us to at least facilitate and see if it's feasible, is to reach out to the Shaw's folks and see if we could have a place where a bus could temporarily pull in and stop um, just for the duration of the construction project, because then at least we can maintain connectivity from downtown across the limited access highway to Shaw's. Um, it really will be um, Shaw's decision though as to whether or not they have the space for that or would allow that. Um, I, our plan would not be to procure right of way to do that for a temporary basis. So it would basically be um, at their will uh, and their support, but it, it could be a benefit to them and their business by adding you know, patronage to them. So hopefully it's something we can work out with them. Um, and the, the goal would be that we maintain that connectivity with existing public infrastructure. And VTrans would be responsible for working that agreement out with Shaw's and doing it, the outreach. Correct, it would be part of the project. So we would have to do some, something similar to like we did with BGS as far as an MOU. It's easy with BGS because they're another state entity. Um, that's actually where I'm going to work. So I'd be able to reach out to them pretty easily. Um, but we would work out, work with Shaw's. Um, but at this time, our plan would not be to procure rights right, from yeah. them. It would basically be you know, executing an agreement if they would be willing to do that. We would be willing to put up you know, temporary facility, line striping and whatnot, to facilitate it, to make sure it was marked and signed appropriately. Um, so that, that would be um, something that's on the table, but we don't know the answer to that yet. Thank you. During the closure, is there a shuttle? I know that was discussed. Is that included in the scope? It is not included in the scope. 
and we were hoping that we could accommodate that with existing shuttle services. Hi. Um, what what level of completion are these plans? We are through conceptual, and we are probably fifty to fifty percent through preliminary. Tom, is that fair? Yeah, even even further than that. I think we expect to have preliminary. In, yeah. Okay, so um, I would just recommend that you, um, in the slope restoration for completing the project, that you consider restoring um, where you can soil and planting with native plantings on the slope. Not so to. I know you need some stone probably for stability, but anything else that's to disturb to try to repair the planting that's removed with some native plants. Thank you. Absolutely. We're putting planting plans in almost all projects now. So uh, something that we've been doing more and more of. All right. And I, pending further discussion, I think we would be looking for um, the select board to basically approve that recommended closure period um, if that's something that you guys would be willing to do, because it is your road. There will need to be some duration that we have to close it. 21, we believe is a very um, kind of happy medium between not closing it the whole time the project's there, but also not constricting the contractor to an unrealistic schedule. But it's possible that it could be done in less. We did do a um, kind of a best case scenario schedule, and I think we were in the 12 day range. Um, but I, I wouldn't want to start there. Um, our preference would be as long as you were amenable to it to, to stick with the 21 days. Could it be up to 21 days? It could be, yes. And although I think the way we would put it in our contract is that um, they will have probably from the time school gets out to the time school starts to perform the 60 day closure, which gives them a little bit of wiggle room on when to start it, not a lot, because there's not much more than 60 days. Right. And then um, that 21 days could occur at any time inside of those 60. They might be consecutive, they might not. They might do seven yeah. days, then open it, and then close it again for seven, I'm not sure, but the way the language would be written, our intent would be to give them up to 21 total days, concurrently within the 60 days. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Do we need a motion now? So, yeah, we would need a motion to approve the Lincoln Street closure for up to um, 21 days. I'll move uh, that we approve the Lincoln Street closure up to 21 days as proposed. And second. I'll second. Further discussion. All right, we'll take a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And the motion passes. Thank you. Anything else? That's it. Right. If you guys have questions, reach out to myself, Tom, and then um, I'll give a formal notice to, to someone here to, about the transition over to Mahindra as the new project manager, but still a state employee, so if you have questions, and I'm still also a town resident, so feel free to reach out to me. I've got a vested interest in this. I drive over it twice a day. <laughs> My kids have kindergarten next year, so <laughs> be right there. Thanks for your help. Thank, Thank you. you Tom, can you um, unshare your screen? Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Oh. Moving along to the manager search committee items. Skip, you were going to speak to that? Yes. All right. Project. Uh, when you update everybody on uh, What's happened since you last appointed uh, two people, uh, Mike and Danny, to the committee and myself and family? Um, we have met with uh, Rick uh, McGuire of the BLTC. Um, three of us were here and two of us uh, were by Zoom. And uh, I would say we've learned a lot since the last meeting, even though we haven't done a lot. Um, with that, um, you know, we appointed two people so we would avoid being a quorum and be to the boards. Um, and it was a question of whether or not the open meeting law applied. But it's a committee 
doing municipal uh, business and falls under the open meeting law. Uh, so that going forward, we're going to need to uh, do agendas, the 48 hour notice, post minutes and things that we're going to have to be in you know, full compliance with the open meeting law. Um, Rick said that other communities have done it following it and uh, it hasn't been a problem. You can go into executive session for interviews and reviewing applications. Uh, Bill has been in touch with uh, Joe McLean who's drafted some uh, motions and things that we would use going forward. So um, even though it maybe complicates planning and doing some things, it's uh, you know what we need to do. Um, and also we were thinking about scheduling our next meeting and the first thing we did was run into vacations. Mm -hmm. So that uh, the question came up whether somebody else could attend the meeting in their place, which I think is a great idea. And uh, I think each board, I would recommend that each board appoint an alternate um, for their two members that if one of those members cannot attend, the alternate could attend. The alternate would get any information that's sent out but not attend the meeting only when uh, the primary uh, member was not able to make it. So um, I would recommend tonight that each uh, board identify an alternate for the uh, two members. Um, and another uh, item that kind of has come to mind, and we talked a little bit about it with Rick, was uh, the number of members and having employee input, maybe a public member uh, and things. And that this committee gets all its uh, authority and direction from the two boards, so that the two boards um, I think are the ones who would decide who the members and the, the uh, members on the committee would be. Um, also, as we sat there with two members each, a four-person committee, it seemed a little odd, even though we had an even number of members, um, that if you look at it, select boards are usually the three or five people and things. You don't have even number of uh, members that, uh, you know, what's a quorum, you can get tie votes and things. Um, so that became apparent as we meeting, and after that meeting, I got an inquiry from the uh, library commissioners that they were interested in maybe participating if they could in this process. Um, and thinking about it, library commissioners are elected just like the select board and the uh, E fund, and uh, even though they are they uh, have a direct role in hiring the manager, he does work with them. He helps with the budget. They're housed here, and uh, you know, are to provide an essential service to the community. So, I would recommend um, to both boards that we authorize the library commissioners to designate one member. Um, to work with the search committee of the two members of uh, each of the boards and they could have an alternate. That, that would give us the five people at the base committee. And if we wanted to uh, talk about having a public member at a future point and or how to uh, get the uh, employee input, we could do that. Um, and the last thing, um, Rick, um, asked us in the meeting if we had uh, seen the service agreement and uh, everybody said no we hadn't seen the service agreement they had sent us a proposal before which was more about their recruitment plan but he has since sent us a two-page service agreement that i think bill has looked at that the two boards need to uh, authorized uh, designated person to sign that agreement to get it back to DLTC and then they'll get started. Um, 
we can't schedule the next meeting until it sends us a recruitment plan, which is really getting started and that we would uh, be going over. So those are the uh, things I think we need to decide tonight going forward so um, that we don't have to have another meeting and we can, uh, you know, the committee can get started getting the agreement signed getting the recruitment plan, set up our meeting through, uh, you know, it's most likely to be a hybrid meeting here. And uh, Rick felt it was uh, more advantageous to him to be on Zoom, he saved travel time and the cost to the community. And uh, if some of the members can't uh, make it for one reason or another, they can be on Zoom. So, uh, so that's my recommendation. You can take them up one at a time, or? What uh, time of day do you have your meetings with the? Uh, well, we, we did one in the morning because we had a bunch of retired people plus one who could work in the evening. But I think going forward, we're going to uh, probably have to pick a day and it may end up being the evening to accommodate everybody. Um, yeah, I think to make it, it so around. that someone from our board could attend, we I advocated so that it could be outside general working hours. Mm -hmm. Also so I could attend, <laughs> so I was elected to be there. Um, so yeah, so I guess first is the idea of um, having an alternate, so if there's interest, We'll start there. Interesting. Sounds like you're just like, great. Throw um, my name into the ring. Okay. I would say in general, and I don't mean to be cranky, but I think I would love to have a conversation about how the communication between this and other boards and committees is going. I just feel like, yeah. again, I'm happy to have you two as a representative. I'm happy to have Roger as an alternate, but I would like to know how and when other board members are receiving information or conveying input outside of when it comes up on these agendas. Yeah, so I, I also would, I think Roger. we started with some miscommunication of who was a contact person, who was a point person, and that didn't, it, it was instantly didn't work. So um, it's, Natalie took minutes at our last meeting. So if you're open to continuing to do that, um, and if not, that's okay, we can ask someone off too. Um, but if you're open to continuing to do that so that we know someone is designated to take minutes and then um, I think it would work best to be distributed to both boards, both full boards, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then that way any questions that come up can follow. That's like the base level. Is there more that we want to start with right now? Well, yeah, so now Skip is going to be the contact person. Um, setting up meetings with Rick and then notifying the rest who are, are going to be in attendance about those meetings or getting consensus on the times. Um, so we'll start there and then if more communication issues come up we can work to resolve them and feel free to not wait till a meeting to ask for more communication if it's needed from anybody. Um, so Roger has volunteered, does anyone else uh, yeah, I don't mean to step on any toes if anybody else is interested. <laughs> I'm willing to do it if you need We need to actually vote on that, I assume, right? So I'll we'll take a motion to appoint Roger as the alternate. So moved. And a second. Thank you. All in favor? Oh, other discussion. Sorry. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Any a motion second? Uh, I motion. Listen. Mike second. Listen. Chris second. Oh, Chris second. Sorry. <laughs> so if i uh, Bob, uh, if he's still there, and Cindy and uh, Lefty, are any of you volunteering to be a alternate? Yes, I could do it. Um, Bob, are you still there? He's there. Computer's uh -huh. I think he's right. here in name only. There, there. <laughs> there. What? Hello, Bob. The, um, I'm reluctant to volunteer. The, um... So you move to a point lefty as the alternate? Well, 
or someone in the room can do that as well. Is there anybody else from Randall Street? Natalie, you want to? I'll make a motion to elect, uh, to choose Lefty as the alternate for the Edward Ferrari Utility District. Oh, second. Motion has been made and seconded to appoint Lefty as the alternate to the uh, manager search committee. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Lefty, congratulations. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a little, uh, maybe now is the time, but. Um, we want to have, I guess, a more holistic conversation about forming the full committee, um, which would include voting on including somebody from the Library Commission, or we can just vote to include someone from the Library Commission now and have a bigger conversation around the committee after our next meeting with Rick. I'm open to whatever works best. I guess my recommendation is to vote now to put somebody from the Library Commission, have them designate mm -hmm. a person. And that's our five person base committee going forward. And then after our next meeting with Rick, we would talk about soliciting yeah, input from the employees and, and the public. Employee uh, coming in. Um, yeah. Question? Yeah, thanks, Kit. Um, so, yeah, Maroni here. I'm actually on the Library Commission. Um, and thank you for bringing this up. I, I just realized, you know, it's been a uh, over a year now just being in the commission and never realized how much uh, close the commission works with the town manager. Um, and so we as a commission thought it would be appropriate for us to be part of this hiring process for a mixed town manager. And so the committee had uh, dedicated me to be the person to be, I mean the, the commission had dedicated me to be on the committee, whatever committee is formed. So, um, Yes, we would love to be part of this process, and, and again, we just think that it's appropriate as, as we go close to the mm -hmm. town manager. So. And to, to expand a little bit, Rick talked about um, like other, other processes he's been through where they do solicit input and individual input from um, employees of the town so that it can be private and not in a group setting to make sure that they have um, a voice as well as submit and in another process getting input from the public as well um, so this would be the base five-person committee okay. yes sir yeah so just to be clear and uh, Maroni is correct that I work very closely with the Library Commission but I want to make sure that all of you and Roger and Alyssa, who are, who are quite new, understand. Um, the, library, the library is the one department of the town that the municipal manager does not have any direct authority over. Uh, the library commissioners are elected by the public. Uh, the way that Wadbury has chosen to follow the state laws with regard to libraries we have an elected library commission. The elected library commission appoints a library director. That's Rachel Muse. Uh, she is the only town employee that the municipal manager doesn't appoint, except the zoning administrator, which is a <laughs> situation. But um, you know, I do work very closely with Rachel in helping with the with the budget. I work with the library commission and try to give them the information that they need to work through this. But I want to make sure that you all understand, because I have no authority in the library, the library commissioners as elected officials have no authority over me either. They are not an appointing body. I think it makes good sense, especially if you're looking for a fifth person. But I just want everybody to understand that while the library Commission should have input. They don't have any authority in making the appointment when the time comes. Thank you. Right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, um, don't we have a number of committees uh, in addition to the library as well? Committee that also perhaps should be considered if we're going to consider the library uh, as an additional member of this commission. Other commission, commission. yeah, or committee. Well, it yeah. seems it, like those other committees might, might also want to know that uh, this is happening. Well, um, there's one other elected commission in town, and that's the Cemetery Commission. Uh, I work with the Cemetery Commission. They have uh, 
They have a trust fund uh, that we use to operate the cemeteries. Presently, there are no dedicated cemetery employees, so there's, you know, uh, the public works director. I, I direct him, and we provide um, whatever labor is necessary outside of contractual work. Um, it's up to the it's up to the select board and the um, EFUD commissioners. Just as with the library, the the cemetery commissioners are not an appointing authority for the municipal manager. Uh, the other boards and commissions, they're just that, they're boards and commissions. And I certainly would not encourage you to put members of the, you know, well, the, we have elected listers as well, but again, they, they don't appoint the, the manager and they have very narrow uh, responsibilities and authority. But the Planning Commission and the DRB and the Recreation Commission Committee and the Conservation Committee, I, I mean, uh, yeah, there's a lot of committees, but before long, you end up with a search committee of 11 or 12 people, and that's unwieldy. But it's your, it's your choice. Uh, yeah, that's, that's my concern, is getting into a quagmire of uh, too many opinions and the ultimate blame, whether it be good or bad. <laughs> Yeah, and recommend that, you know, a cap. be the board, the final decision making. Uh, so you just want to be careful that we don't end up with too much input. opinionated drag down of this process. Mm -hmm. Mike, did you have a very my voice. As much as I respect our library, Commissioners, I think they do a wonderful job, but I'm a little bit just like what Chris says. I hate to have, and I know we're not going to appoint every commission with a seat on this table, but I'm more open to looking at a public member who could be a library commissioner, could be a lot of other, could be an employee, could be a whole bunch of different things, but I don't necessarily think we should have, it's kind of like, you know, we're saying a certain group should have a seat at the table. I don't, you know, I don't think the library commissioner, would, I think would probably be a good choice, but I think we want to keep the numbers down and we should keep our options open. I just want to move forward with a execution and figure out the other members. Uh, I, I, will say, I will say with, with, for the, you know, in deference to the library, um, while I'm not an appointing authority over any library employees, it's a rather large department. Uh, they fall under the municipal personnel policy. The library employees get all benefits that all other municipal employees get. So, it, you know, it's a big segment of the of the municipality that uh, that the library commissioners oversee, and it's an important service. So I'm not here to say you should or you shouldn't, but I just want everybody to understand that they do have quite a bit of uh, skin in the game, if you will, when it comes to employees. Roger, yeah. Yeah, um, we have a recommendation from EFUD. Um, this uh, appears to be one of the few commissions that's actually elected by the townspeople, which I think differentiates it from the Recreation Committee and the Planning uh, Commission. So, uh, and I too would like to see this process move forward. So I'm gonna move that we accept uh, the recommendation from EFUD uh, that we appoint uh, a uh, represent representative from the Library uh, Commission to be uh, the fifth uh, member of this uh, um, committee. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? I would say we should encourage them to include an alternate too if that's what all the boards are doing. Yeah, excellent. And I would like to add as well. Meet, meet first, I second Monday? Monday? Yeah. I guess that would just mean my one is I support it, I'm going to vote for it. I think, it, I don't want to say it's presumptive, but I think 
I just to echo for the record Roger's point, I think it is a diff distinction from the other boards and commissions which we appoint. So then it's like we would appoint someone and then put someone on the committee and it gets huge right. um, because the library commissioners are elected. I think it really makes sense um, to be that fifth member. We should encourage them to have an alternate as, as well. Do you want to say well. in your motion a representative and alternate? Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. Perfect. So I will bring this to the, uh, to the commission. Our next meeting is uh, the 11th, I believe, next month. Um, so we'll figure out the alternate person will be. Um, and then before the vote as well, just to say, oh. Maroney, is there any way to move a decision quicker? Because we, we really want to No, just for an alternate. They've already oh, appointed. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, just the alternate. So, yeah, just to say that there will be routes via our work with VLCT to solicit input from boards, committees, commissions, public members, and employees. That was something we all said was important to us going forward in the process. So it's not just five people in a room making decisions without external input. So that's important to all of us. Um, further discussion? That's to be clear, are we setting that five people as the hiring committee definitively forever, or is there still the opportunity? I, I don't again, I'm not trying to prolong my guidance. For, for that. No, yeah, that's I'm not okay. a solid in the motion. The motion is just to add a library commissioner. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. Well, this is so, just, to be, just to be clear, so we we'll said a hiring committee. Or sorry, 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 sorry. Search sorry. 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 the boards cannot delegate their authority to hire to the sorry. Right. Yeah. Could, just could working on that guidance. Yeah. And then if if we could the EFUD, I'd like to make a similar motion yes. on behalf of EFUD um, to add a, a library commissioner and a, um, a alternate to the search committee. So is there a second to that motion? A second. Motion has been made and seconded to uh, add a library commissioner to the search committee and an alternate uh, going forward. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Well, aye. 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 Uh, motion passes. And I, I think, uh, just speaking to Chris's things, there doesn't have to be any more people on this committee than the two boards um, authorize there. So it it isn't gonna grow to six and eight unless you want it to. So I don't think adding one more member is not something that's uh, you know foreseeing the future to come that we add a person every meeting. But I do think um, you know Bill's point that it's elected and I, I think it's a good move. Um, so, um, the last thing uh, was the uh, service agreement with the uh, Tower of Waterbury and the Edward Flower Utility District with the Le Vermont League of Cities and Towns uh, laid it out and it agrees somewhere to add a dollar, oh, $7, and seven thousand two hundred and fifty dollars uh, and authorizes the league professional services at ninety dollars an hour if uh, we need and it's set up that the uh, town of waterbury select board chair would sign if it's authorized and the district chair of the utility commission and i assume but uh, bill has looked at this have you heard yeah, I didn't see any issues with it. I think there'll be another agreement that comes after in terms of the whole recruitment effort that will be more similar to what you reviewed a couple of meetings ago. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. And so there may be some additional costs beyond it. So. Uh, I, mean, I guess every copy had draft on it, did it? I, I don't know. The draft for 14 on the one I printed, so I don't know if they uh, <coughs> want to send us one without draft <laughs> that we signed. Um, if you could at least approve it, yeah. mm -hmm. and then that way we can let them know that it's been approved, but they need to send, they can put their the signature country. on it first, and then we can get it to you. And, yeah. and then Skip, when he sends it, 
I guess, well, I guess that's between me and you, Mike, that someone should send it to the full board to look at as well. So if you want to take that responsibility, perfect. <clears throat> Um, I authorize Mike Bard to be able to sign the service agreement with the League of Cities and Towns on behalf of the select board once finalized and unofficially to also distribute it to board members individually. Thank you. I'll second that. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Do you Sorry. need to do this same? Yeah. I'll make a motion that they, that, uh, uh, the chairman of Water, uh, the Edward Ferrar Utility District signed the service agreement with the LTC. Is there a second? I'll second it. Motion that's made and seconded to have the uh, chairman of the district, Edward Ferrar Utility District, sign the agreement with uh, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns for the manager search. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. So. so moving on uh, to the town. Yeah. I don't, oh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I couldn't something. see you. <laughs> Next meeting. Do we, uh, for the agreement? No. Post. What? I'm sorry. I don't know what you're asking. <laughs> the committee would be, we, we're going to do the agreement. Right, well, I think we're waiting, uh, it needs to be signed and sent back, and then he's going to send the term, the recruitment agreement, and then we are setting the next meeting, is what Skip said. Right. So I'm deferring to that. To do it or something. I think now is, Too early. yeah, and just time-wise, not the best use of time. But let's work on it. Uh, next up is the town MOU regarding the land transfer. Okay. Hi, Steve. Welcome so, back. Uh, no, 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 no,
um, this was a, a discussion about that the town, if it decided to develop the Rusty Parker Park, would have to come back to E5 and, and give them a chance to purchase it back and the like. We didn't take this out, but subsequent to the um, to the original draft, Skip found records in the land records that stipulate that the, the property can only be used for public uses. Mm -hmm. So there's really little, we don't have to take it out uh, of the agreement in case somebody down the road wants to talk about it. But uh, there's very little likelihood that that will ever happen given the restriction of the making that decision, right? right. I'll move to accept uh, the proposal from EFED as so written. Second. My second. Any further discussion? Yeah, it says Appendix A to be determined, but I assume it's the four properties we've previously received at the last joint meeting with EFED. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. And I also think, I don't know if you said it or not, but um, Likely the voters will, the voters are going to be asked to approve this, the EFUD voters, and um, gives till the end of the year for it to be able to happen. So that will just make sure all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. So. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Um, so if I can work that, yeah. <laughs> the motion that we uh, authorize the Trinity uh, Utility District to sign the MOU with uh, the town of Waterbury regarding the transfer of the property, and the will so, so not be charged rent in the future. So moved. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Carla. Good move. <laughs> Is there a second to it? A second. Motion has been made and seconded to authorize the chairman to sign the uh, MOU with the town and the Edward Ferrar Utility District regarding the transfer of property. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Motion passes. We heard you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, last on the joint meeting agenda is the review, the RFP for recreation master planning. And now, Steve, welcome again. Sorry, <laughs> Bill, did you want to introduce us? Uh, no, I think I think uh, everybody's all set. Nick's in the back of the room as well. Nick had a big hand in uh, writing this uh, RFP and shared with the recreation committee, so. He's hiding way back there. <laughs> well, I'll speak to that. It's pretty straightforward. Okay. So I've got a couple copies here. Um, I didn't bring one for everybody, but I did bring a couple copies. Uh, this was sent to you uh, at the end of last week. So um, Bill asked Nick and me to put together a request for proposals. Um, I'll drop my mask here for a minute so people can hear a little better. Um, and this is for a uh, consultant study and master plan for two parks, for Hope Davy Park and for the um, area in the vicinity of the ice center. So we have one town-owned uh, park and we have one owned by the um, EFUD. So um, we met with the Recreation Committee last week and got their input, Frank Spalding, is um, on Zoom, and um, let's see, we've got um, Meg and Jane. Meg was on the call. Um, I'm not sure if she's still here, but uh, Meg Baldor. But uh, Frank is here, and so we had a very good discussion uh, with the Recreation Committee, got some good input. Um, I incorporated their comments into the request, request proposal before sending it to you. Uh, this would utilize the $50,000 that was approved by the voters at town meeting. And uh, the goal would be to have a very inclusive process 
Um, we'd have a, a, probably a total of three public meetings, uh, the last one being a presentation of the report to um, the select board and the EFUD commissioners. Uh, the goal is that we would um, solicit proposals, a competitive process, uh, get proposals in uh, mid-May. Uh, we bring a recommendation to uh, the select board, since this is town funds, uh, at your first meeting in June and hire a consultant. The goal would be to wrap up the study uh, by mid-December, so we'd be within the fiscal year. And I think at this point, we're really uh, just uh, looking for any further input um, that uh, the select board and the EFUD commissioners have before we, uh, we advertise this. Uh, we have put the draft on our website. Uh, we intend this to be a, a fully open and inclusive process. So uh, with that, uh, contemplates, you have, a, contemplates a steering committee being appointed at some point? Right, it does, Bill. So uh, the steering committee would be approximately, we said approximately eight members. We'd have representative from the Recreation Committee, um, if the select board and the EFUD commissioners would choose, uh, they, you could each have a representative. Uh, we would have uh, the various uh, interest groups that are involved with the parks, uh, the center chains golf course people, the uh, capital soccer that uh, leases space at the ice center, the ice center, Washington West, uh, the Water Area Trails Alliance that um, helps manage the Perry Hill Trails and the access and the pump park, and then we want a member, uh, at least one member of the public, um, perhaps from the vicinity of, um, of Hope Davy Park that would participate as well. So that would be a steering committee that would be involved with staff and the consultant to, um, to carry out the study and um, take it to its conclusion. The, the goal would be to have recommendations on both the recreation facilities and the protection of natural resources uh, in these park areas, the wetlands, the forest resources, and so on. So um, in terms of both the um, development of any new facilities, modification of existing facilities, and then um, recommendations on any uh, protective measures that may be needed for the natural resources. Uh, we start out with an inventory process and then move towards a what I think of as the master planning process with public input and then conclude with a, with a final draft and uh, recommendations and um, some graphic uh, plans that would be presented. So Nick, I don't know if you had anything or Frank, you had anything you wanted to add? No? Yeah, so I think at this point we're really looking for any input or comments that you have before we would um, We'll move ahead with uh, with advertising. I was just going to say I gave uh, the timeline Bill sent out um, is is uh, it's not tight, but it's um, you know it's important we follow it. So I've given the select board until next next month to appoint uh, the rec their uh, the recommendation for someone to be on the steering committee, as well as uh, Tammy's on the call, but. Um, they're, they have a coalition down there at the ice center of, of the interest groups, so the WADA, the dog park, uh, the ice center, and their skate park group. Um, and so they're gonna, at that meeting, it's gonna be two for one, they're gonna recommend as a select board, or the rec, rec committee, who they would like to appoint to the um, steering committee as well. Yeah, I forgot to mention the skateboard park group. Sorry, Tammy. That's... Yeah, now I would recommend to the select board to authorize the, uh, the distribution and advertisement of the RFP, but simultaneously, I think you should um, ask, you know, begin the solicitation process for people who want to serve on the steering committee. I think you can appoint that steering committee, um, perhaps at the meeting that you choose, the, you know, you, that you review the proposals. But I think it would be helpful to get all of it going as opposed to wait until we get a consultant and then appoint the steering committee. So. I, I would agree, Bill. And um, <clears throat> we, we're also going to need to have a small um, selection group that would uh, potentially interview consultants. But um, I think the, um, what Bill and I, Nick, 
Bill and I discussed is that the select board would actually appoint the member of the public as well. Right. When we get to that point, we'll, we'll probably solicit interest from members of the public that are in the vicinity of these parks and then have you actually make that appointment. Good question. question. Steve, uh, does the, uh, you mentioned the historic site, the old cellar hole, and what impact that may have as I uh, know we worked with uh, historic division, whatever they are, right. to be able to, uh, you know, either cover over that cellar hole <laughs> that it looks like it could be a significant uh, factor in deciding what you could do there that you know, we were hoping not to have to preserve it. So right. So that's a good point. Um, in the request proposal, we've asked for um, a um, survey of the archaeological resources, but it would um, be a compilation of all of the existing studies that we have, including the most recent one of the, uh, the site. This is a, a um, former house that um, is the clump of trees in the middle of the former cornfield that, that uh, Skip is talking about. And then also do a, sort of just a broad survey level for Hope Davy. So I think in answer to your question, that can be part of the uh, the study is is how to move forward. Did the did the state never respond to our request? To what, what yeah, they they have the not state? responded with, with. So so they haven't acted. They have not acted. No, they and have I think, all the information right. that we sent, but, right. but they haven't made any determination. They have not made a determination. We may have to apply for a permit to develop a facility to get a determination from them. But this is something that I think the consultant can help us stop. <laughs> You know, sometimes that's what you have to do is push the envelope. But well, that's something that I think the consultant can advise us on, Bill, is how to move forward with that. And maybe uh, needle the division for historic preservation a little bit to give us an answer. Does it also address the moving of the road as to the future use of the area? The fact that whether or not the road gets and the cost associated with that? Yeah, def definitely, that will be part of We're turning over though that study, so they're going to take that into consideration when they're looking at that part. That's definitely. That's a big part of the center piece. Mm -hmm. But at this point, you're looking for authorization to uh, put out the RFP and to solicit uh, membership on the steering committee. Right. right. Is that correct? I will so move. A second. Come up. Mike, second? Oh, well, do you want to second it and then further have discussion? Okay, seconded and now further discussion. My only comment is, as much as I think this is a wonderful moving document, I think that if you go forward, big committees, everyone can't be represented because if you have a big giant committee, nothing happens. So I, you know, I'm not saying have a three, four member committee, but have a reasonable amount of people and other people could be represented by their comments or something like that. That's my only suggestion. I, I think it's a wonderful idea and I want to see it move forward. I'm going to put a number on it, like nine. No, I think that's well, too I thought you said yeah, Mike, right now I've, I've asked the select board, or the recreation committee to select one member to represent them and the coalition, the, uh, the skate park coalition, the, the River Road Access Park, uh, one member from them. They can choose either WADA or Dog Park. But yeah, so, so far, that's me, Steve, two more people. It's just four. Then, hopefully, a community member, too, or a select board member, right? We're looking at like six. So, six. That sounds like a can, can I just make a comment? Um, I, I totally agree with, with Mike's point, but I also think that we need to think in terms of who we are having in this committee have people who represent diverse communities as well. I think it's a steering committee, so I will say for the search, not hiring committee, as we said earlier, I think there's probably more of an ongoing workload. My sense is this is to help define the scope and make sure that they're conducting outreach appropriately to all of these other communities. So for a working committee, I think that seems reasonable. Um, I was going to add, can we as a select board maybe have like an application process? I'm just saying, uh, just my personal preference, we did it this today for planning commission, but like a one page form where you're, if you are interested or just have them send a paragraph to Carla, I just personally find it nice to have something 
the person's name who's interested in the committee and why they're on the committee, and we can still bring them into interview. I think that's fine. I just think some base formality might be useful. I, I agree. I think you know a little bit more process would help us all in, in our organization and, and feel prepared. Um, so we would we would need to come up with that. By when would we want to have that process? I mean, you could just like, send your name and a paragraph about why you're interested to Carla. I'm not saying we need to go yeah. zero to sixty, but I think some yeah. in that advertisement. Can I say something, please? Sure, Tom. Uh, I just would like to have uh, the, the, the disabled population represented on that committee. Mm -hmm. There are significant ADA issues out on the uh, whole daily and need to be addressed. Thanks, Tom. Okay. Can, Can I just mention something? Yes. I'd, I'd rather the, the number not be too restrictive. Uh, I would say eight is what we wrote in here, so we can get each of yeah. the primary interest groups represented. I don't want to cut somebody out, quite honestly. I think it's better to have an inclusive process, yes. perhaps someone who's, um, you know, has, has a dis or differently able um, as well. So uh, that would be my suggestion, would be to let us work with the applicants. We, we can put, we can, staff can solicit applications and then you can ultimately decide if you like. Um, yeah, our original motion did not have a number in it, and I don't think we need to add one. Okay. We'll let you. Um, can when you say Carla, we, would you, what you talk about? Do, do we, doing what? I'm no, sorry. when you say we can. Well, I think SAP is going to do the solicitation, and then uh -huh. the, well, we can bring the applications to you. I, I'm talking about it. staff can put together the process okay. of soliciting. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Clarification. But do you guys have a draft RFP yet? Because the scope sounds far in excess of what $50,000 yeah. would be. So it would be overly broad and you might not actually have anything to implement or move forward with. Is we there do. a way to review that? I, I review consult proposals all day. It's on the town website. All day. Yeah, so, so as Steve said, it's on the right. website. So we want it to be as public as possible. Or they have made it as public as possible. So it can definitely be reviewed. And then I would reach out what to you, Steve, or to all. You and Steve, Steve's fine. Sure. Okay. Okay. I'll not to come over. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And we're going to be public with the budget, too, to be honest with you. Right. So consultants are going to have to yeah. tell us what they can do for that. Right. Exactly. But 50000 doesn't break much. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. We to consider select a board member on that group. We're involved in, we're going to eventually be involved in the process. I have no problem. I think we have a lot of talented people in our community that could well represent a lot of different interests and when they're eventually going to come to us I don't know if we need to be speak, you know be intimately involved on that committee you know that's like I should be involved on every committee personal opinion your goal was to have a select board member we're, we're, the committee we want that open. option available yeah. to you yeah. it was Perfect. a suggestion that's for great. the EFUD commissioners yeah. but that's really up to you Carla, can you read that motion back now, please? It's been a little while. Sorry. No, no, it's not you. I need to wordsmith this a little, but okay. I've not made a motion to put out the RFP and solicit membership for the steering committee. Perfect. So we're not locked into being on the committee in any way with that motion. It's been moved and seconded. Anything further? All right. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Excellent. That passes. Okay. You need Thank to you. do the same for that, or? I don't well, know. It's town to... funds. Okay. It was just yeah. under the joint, so I didn't know. I, I know that's up to you. If you want them. No. no. Okay. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Our next motion is to adjourn. Love that for you. Love that for you. Can we accept that? I don't think so. I move to adjourn. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you for the evening. Thank you very much. Okay. Only 45 minutes past agenda time. Um, we are moving on to manager's items, starting with the Vermont State Police report. Bill. So since we're 45 minutes past, and since I forgot to send out the police report, we'll do those at a future meeting. Excellent. So I don't hate that. We can uh, move, move Thank you all. That one. See you right now. Mass Exodus. Okay. We will move on. Our lost revenue. 
So at the last meeting, at the last meeting, we talked about ARPA, and we talked, you know, we appointed uh, Nick to um, to move up to the primary uh, designated liaison, whatever the, the, the name is. Um, and we talked about the fact that we want to take advantage of using lost revenue as the means by which we're going to uh, disseminate our ARPA funds. And I think that there was uh, broad agreement about that, but when I read the minutes, even though I thought I heard somebody make a motion to suggest they were going to do that, it wasn't in the minutes. So either Carolyn didn't hear it or I heard something that wasn't said. So I would like to recommend to the select board that you uh, approve uh, filing our, uh, our ARPA report to indicate to the federal government that we are going to choose the uh, option of using lost revenue as our means to appropriate the funds. So moved. Is there a second? Moved and seconded. Further discussion? Oh. <laughs> All right, those in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes. Next up, first quarter budget review. This won't take yeah. long. I will pass those out. I apologize. Um, I really got uh, kind of hijacked or sidetracked, whatever you want to say, last week. And while I had finished this report, I ended up never sending it out and uh, said, well, it's not that difficult to just present it tonight. I told the board at the last meeting or a couple of meetings ago that typically I will report to the board uh, on a quarterly basis the, the budget. And um, we really didn't have an official budget until the 1st of April, even though we have been spending on that budget since the 1st of January. Um, there's, at this time of year, there's very, very rarely anything um, that's really out of line. We typically don't get uh, big storms and the like that can cause our highway budget to go haywire this time of year. We might get a big snowstorm, but uh, you know that, that usually doesn't end up costing tons and tons of money. When we get to the highway budget in a minute, I will share some um, concerns with you, however. On the first page, the first two pages really, and I, I copied these back to back. This is our, uh, our revenues. Our major tax, taxes are our major revenue. We don't collect taxes until uh, August. So until we send the tax bills out, we're gonna be way behind the calendar when it comes to uh, revenue. Um, so all in all, we've received, uh, well, this adds up to about 0% of our of our revenue to date. Um, so uh, it's a little higher than that. I think I didn't carry that number down uh, to that last one. But there's nothing unusual about what we're receiving for our revenues right now. Um, the town clerk's fees were about 21%. That's on the first page. Um, and I would say that usually the the first quarter is the slowest quarter, there's property transfers and the like in recording, typically uh, ramp up a little bit. Uh, we have taken in a considerable amount of recreation programming fees already. You can see we've taken in uh, almost 68% of the rec program revenues, that's for the day camp. Um, and, um, you know, we opened that up on um, town meeting day for registration and the day camp sold out in three minutes or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got that, that uh, revenue. The uh, mini camp income, we should really change that line. Is that after school programming mostly? Nick? We'll, get, we'll get most of that in the fall. Yeah, but we're already, we're still ahead of the calendar at 32% there. 
Um, moving through into the expense side of things, uh, our pay lines are typically our, are the, the highest single expense, uh, as is the case with almost any organization that has uh, the numbers of employees that we have. Um, you can see there the regular pay is about 22% right now. And this is all through March 31st, uh, so the last couple of weeks aren't included here. Uh, and the fact that we're 22% through through 25% of the of the budget year just indicates that uh, wage increases and salary increases that were budgeted don't happen until the second quarter, so we're typically going to lag there a little bit. There are some things like health insurance that we actually pay in advance. So we paid uh, four months worth of health insurance through three months of time here because we paid through April. So the fact that that's at about 30% is normal. Same with uh, disability insurance. Unemployment insurance, workers' compensation insurance, uh, property and casualty insurance, you'll see those are all 50% spent. Mm -hmm. We pay those quarterly, but in advance. So on the 1st of January, we pay for the first quarter. For the 1st of April, we pay for the second quarter. So we, we've paid up those insurances through the, uh, through the middle of the year. Um, there's a few line items that are over. We spent $259 more on printing the annual reports than, than we had budgeted, but, you know, uh, but that expense is done for the year. Association dues, again, uh, that, that's front-loaded. We pay dues and the like uh, uh, early. Um, there are some transfers that are in the general fund. So the, about two-thirds of the way down on the first page of the general budget, you see that to MBOF. MBOF is the Municipal Building Operating Fund. We transfer that money, and the library transfers money from our operating budgets to the, to the operating, the municipal building operating fund, where all the expenses of this building are paid for. It's paid for by uh, on a percentage basis. The library pays a little bit higher percentage than than the general government does because the library has a little bit more square footage than we have on this side of the building. We make those transfers at the end of each quarter so that they just they they kind of are in line with the budget when we make the budget report. Um, fire department, nothing really special there. Um, the regular pay line is uh, what we pay the fire fighters for training and for maintenance meetings. So they meet twice a month for training and once a month for maintenance meetings. That money is paid at the end of the year. It's pretty typically very close to what that budget number is. They, they, in effect, they kind of take the money and then they count the number of total uh, person meetings that there were and then they divide it up that way. The part-time pay line is call pay, so when they get fire calls and the like, uh, it, gets, it gets paid for from that. And we, we pretty typically pay uh, quarterly for that. And it just so happens that we've had a little bit more than 25% uh, spent to date. Um, the building maintenance line is, looks way ahead of the calendar. We have some uh, maintenance contracts that we pay on an annual basis, so things like elevator maintenance, heating and ventilation, and mechanical system maintenance. We have contracts with those companies and we pay those contracts at the beginning of the year. And uh, so it, it shows that there's a lot of expenditures there. Um, I think everything else there I've already explained. Um, can turn over Health and Human Services, you haven't spent and not public and <laughs> health and social services. We haven't spent anything there yet. Um, and more uh, to come there. Then 
after that we have the uh, pool, which we do have some spending in pool this time of year because we have swim lessons that are ongoing. Um, Where? What's that? Stow. Stow. We, oh, up at Stow. We rent, okay. we rent facilities and, uh, gotcha. and do swim lessons uh, all year round. Um, the, you can see in the rec programs, the mini camp pay line, again, that's really after school programming, so we, we have that ongoing through the year, uh, so we've spent some money there. Um, looks like on the unemployment line, uh, there's, I gotta check out why that is. Uh, overspent already. It's not a big, it's only $575 budget. So it's either I've uh, made a mistake in budgeting or in paying, or it could be that we had the audit already and I assigned some of the uh, additional money from last year's audit to that line. So it's a uh, it's an outlier when you look at percentages, but again, it's only a couple hundred dollar budget. Um, rec administration, <coughs> the lion's share of that is the uh, recreation director's pay. Uh, so that's in line with the budget, a little bit lagging behind because raises uh, during this period have not come into effect yet. When do those go into effect? Um, around then. Okay. Um, Nick, com computer services, do you remember what that is? It's our, our recreation website, handles okay. our registration. So again, that's that's a we have uh, we have a, a website that people can sign up and register and pay and do all of their interacting with the uh, with the the town and we pay for that at the beginning of the year. So again that's pretty much fully spent. There's some other things that our IT director does from time to time. Uh, that's a private contractor that we have that does IT. So uh, that line item looks like it will probably be overspent a little bit. Um, parks, really not much there It's yet. like uh, back on the uh, rec administration, looks like your fuel bill went up. Uh, over yeah, all our, all our fuel bills went up. Um, but that could be that Michelle, the bookkeeper, put that in the wrong line. You see the line above that mm -hmm. is the actual heating expense line. Yeah. Uh, so my guess is that 1068 should be up on the, the line above that as opposed to the burn service that we would pay for out of the $300 line. So it just might be mm -hmm. uh, this, uh, this yeah. post there, Roger. Uh, but when it comes to fuel, uh, all our fuel lines are going to be over because, you know, um, in, right after we adopted the budget, the fuel expenses started going through the roof. So we'll deal with that as it comes. Uh, nothing much has been spent in parks yet. Um, the health insurance line, one of the highway employees works in the in the parks budget and and we split the uh, the health insurance payments between the highway budget and the parks budget so that's going to be a skew but that's really the only one that looks uh, really out of, out of whack nothing in particular in the planning budget that's uh, unusual that i can see anyway uh, debt management uh, that again is we pay from the debt management budget into the municipal operating fund, municipal building operating fund. Here the bond will be paid at the end of the year. Uh, and uh, actually the, the payment is interest in May and then interest in principal in uh, November, I think. So that's going to follow the calendar. Uh, I budgeted very little for interest expense, which would be for tax anticipation borrowing. 
Uh, I talked to you all during the budget building process that because of the $775,000 of aqua money that we received last year that we haven't really spent yet, we still have a fairly healthy um, balance in our bank account. The last I looked last week, it was still over $900,000. So we may end up having to do a little tax anticipation borrowing right before we send out tax bills, but uh, right now things are looking pretty good. So we won't have any uh, huge expenses there. The special articles, uh, we pay those, uh, all of those uh, not-for-profits uh, at the end of the year, uh, so that, that budget is not spent. Um, the exception of the senior center? Right. The senior center gets paid out of two budgets. If you look at the mm -hmm. senior center line in the general government budget, you'll see that we're, we pay them monthly, but um, uh, we haven't started paying out of the special article one yet. The, the three, uh, or the two big ones at the bottom of the page on the uh, special articles are the appropriation to the ICE Center and the Recreation Master Planning. Uh, the ICE Center, um, we haven't made that payment yet. Uh, we wanted to, first of all, we had to wait for the budget to be uh, officially deemed good after 30 days, and then you don't, don't want to make that payment uh, and have to report on it in this reporting period. So that will be later in the year. And I'll talk to them. I'm probably going to ask them if we can hang on to that money until after we start taking in tax money so we don't have to borrow. So that will go that will up. Um, what are the municipal taxes do? So we bill the taxes in July, and we're on uh, modified accrual accounting. So as soon as we send the bills, it's going to show as a revenue on the on the, okay, um, yeah. on the revenue that. reports. But of course, it won't do anything for our bank account until people actually start paying. And uh, you know, uh, I used to joke that now I'm getting to be an old person, but I used to joke that. <laughs> we send out the tax bills, and then you know, three days after we sent them out, many of the elderly people would come in, and I would say they're not due until August. And they'd say, "Well, I don't want to owe it if I die, so I'm going to pay it now." <laughs> <laughs> um, taxes are due in August. And this, and, you know, <laughs> so I always laughed about that. More of it, but amazing. Um, fund twelve is the highway fund. <laughs> Again, property taxes are the lion's share of the revenue there. We, uh, when July comes and the tax bills go out, that 16, 1.6 million will show as a revenue there. Um, all of the funds, other than the general fund, get all of their tax, everything due them as soon as it's billed. So we'll bill out $12 million worth of taxes. They'll be, you know, uh, well, actually, it'll be about 15 million now, 16 million. There'll be 12 million dollars due to the school that will go on the balance sheet, and then 1.6 million will go to the highway fund, and 400 and whatever thousand to the library fund, and then um, the balance will be posted to the general fund, and all those funds will get all of their money, and whatever delinquencies are existing at the end of the year will be. Um, absorbed by the general fund. That's just how the law works. What's this? Look, looks like just the formula yeah, was off, but have, yeah. has anything, yeah. but so, nothing paid. So the, the, if you see a, a number sign with a divided by zero and an exclamation point, it means that I didn't hide that particular cell. I just copied those formulas down. And what that's telling you is if you divide anything by zero, it's, it's zero, so it shouldn't be there. Um, we, don't, we're not, we don't get that payment anyway any longer. It shouldn't even be on. Okay, so it'll be omitted in the future. Um, 
So on the highway expenses, if you look at that. So from revenue, what's the transfer in for ARPA that's budgeted for highway fund? That's just that. Just, it's, just temporary. It's, it's just, uh, well, it's, it's was used to balance the highway budget. It's lost revenue and when the select board uh, put together the budget, I recommended that we would use $600,000 for the transfer to EFUD, $100,000 uh, to the ICE Center, and this $95,000 is here for highway funds. And what I told the select board was that, you know, if at the end of the year, as is the case fairly regularly, if if our balance sheet is showing that we don't need to transfer that money, we won't. But right now, we, we did budget $95,000 of our funds to go into the into the highway fund, just as you know, as lost you know, as lost revenue. Um, so, if you look at the expenses for the highway department, um, you'll see a couple of things that uh, are of a of concern. We already talked about fuel lines. There's some fuel lines that are already overspent. I'm not sure why the propane. And sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, uh, the tank empties in the 1st of January or the you know, 10th of January. They come and they fill it and then we don't get the bill until after. So those, those kind of Things are always a little bit of a of a guessing game, um, but the line item that I want to point out to you is um, is it? oh, it's not here yet. That's so I'm, I'm ahead of myself. So you all know that mud season was particularly bad this year. And um, I guess we made the payment in April and not March, so it's not showing up here yet. But um, we did far exceed that stone budget. In fact, it's in the $20,000 range. Um, we budgeted 9,000. I think I think that is. It's either going to go on that line or the emergency road repair line, which really doesn't matter because the emergency road repair line doesn't have a budget, um, a budget line, uh, an, an appropriation anyway. We we have that line to just show if we've had any really emergency expenses, but we don't budget for it typically. Um, we bought quite a bit more stone than we expected. Um, Nine thousand dollars is typically what we've been spending, uh, and we we spent about twenty-five or twenty-six, I believe, already on on stone. Uh, much of that stone is not uh, was not used. I mean, a good portion of it was used, but um, the rest of it's in a stockpile and it's there for future use. We went into the year, frankly, with. Uh, less than Bill Woodruff would have liked, and I didn't go into uh, detail about why, but um, you know, the stone doesn't go bad. We've paid for it, it's there. It's probably going to cost less this year than it will next year, so it will um, hurt our budget uh, for now. Um, and we do have the um, ability, if necessary, if, if the year continues going really uh, awry as far as large expenditures in the highway department, if we have to, we can reduce the amount of money that gets transferred to the general, I mean to the capital funds. The last line item on, the, on that budget is a it's almost $795,000 that we're transferring to the capital fund, which is an increase over last year. I didn't bring the annual report with me, but it's a significant increase over last year. I'm hoping that things will balance out as we go through the remainder of the year and it won't be uh, too uh, difficult. 
and we'll still be able to make the full transfer, but if, if it's necessary, we can reduce that transfer into the capital funds to uh, save the cash and, and balance the budget this year. But we're a long way from knowing that or doing that at this point. So um, as time goes by, and we won't really know until um, you know, getting through the summer well into the fall. Typically, our most expensive seasons for emergencies are summers. Um, that seems a little um, seems a little bit odd to people when they say, "Well, gee, summers. That why do we have emergency road repairs there?" That's typically when you get flash floods. You get gully washers, and we end up having to to go out and. Uh, you know, repair a lot of washed out roads. And I'm not talking about Irene type things. I'm just talking about, um, you know, you lose Shaw Mansion Road and Parla Perry Hill and Green Road or, you know, Wooded Hill Road and, and uh, Barnes Hill. One, one year, you know, right below Barnes Hill, right below the water treatment plant. I think it was about three years after the plant was built. We had a wicked rainstorm and Badger Brook came out of its banks and uh, the brand new water line that we had just installed was in the air. There was no road there at all. Um, when those things happen, it costs money. So we won't be in a position to know um, whether we're going to have a bad year or just a moderately bad year until uh, well into September or October, but uh, that's where we're going now. So the last page was the library fund. I didn't mean to skip over that, but the library budget is, uh, there's almost no, um, there's almost nothing that can happen that will cause the library budget to go exceedingly over, you know, even if we, had a fire head <laughs> we would uh, have insurance that would cover that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, you could have somebody decide that they, you know, a couple of years ago we had three people that unexpectedly left and you have to hire new people and that can cause a little havoc. But typically the library budget always comes out pretty close to on the budget. So. If you have questions, I'll try to answer them. Otherwise, uh, stay tuned. Just wondering uh, if, if you normally do have uh, emergency road repairs, why don't you budget for it? Well, we don't. We don't always have them. Budget. Um, we used to. We used to budget for it. Uh, we put five thousand dollars in there. Uh -huh. And then it turned out, well, five thousand dollars really doesn't represent an emergency to us anymore. You know, back when I started here, five thousand dollars was was a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, we can have like this mud season that probably cost us between materials and equipment and manpower that might have cost us, you know, eighty. $80,000 or so, and it's still not going to mm -hmm. cause any big problem. Yeah. So if you put it on, if you put a number in the budget, then you have to raise that in taxes. We're, we're required to have a balanced budget. So what, we, what we've what done now is keep the line item there just to show that if something does happen, we can yeah. push the expense on that line and yeah. then it's a more visual explanation to the voters that we had an emergency that caused us to go way over our spending. So, okay. Good question. I did speak to Bill Woodruff a little bit about the issues surrounding mud season this year, and his comment was, "Well, it was a warmer than normal spring," and I said, "Well." I think it's going to become the norm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So 
I think maybe as the summer goes on here, if we have the chance to talk about solutions to some of this, mm -hmm. these types of problems, especially with the fact that we've got and whether we can use some of the ARPA money to help address those issues so they're not reoccurring because you know the money that was spent was was needed to be spent but the problem is mm -hmm. <coughs> when you throw that stone into the mud mm -hmm. it doesn't solve the problem right right there are other line issues back right? there throwing the stone in the same mud again and the mm -hmm. problem's not going to go away yeah and the, you know we need to start trying to That's fix right, the problem up. as opposed to band-aid it is that something you want to put in a parking lot for future meeting, like mud season considerations or road? I would say that, or maybe even ARPA. I don't know if we, I know it was our it's previous it's agenda items, but I just wanted to say oh, for the record. let's put it on. Well, or even just to say, for people listening, and I just, I should have seen yeah. it after I made the motion, like that was just for us to allocate what we're doing to the feds. And I just wanted to be clear to residents that that's our reporting we're doing to Treasury, but we still, need to, to talk about the larger funding yeah, it's issue of ARPA funds. Yeah. For. Do you want something in the parking lot? ARPA fund uh, uh, consideration? Or Just say use for, of, use of ARPA funds. Yeah. I mean, we don't have to put it, the parking lot doesn't have to be a thing. I just wanted to no, say because, because I made because that we'll motion. we'll keep talking about it and then we're going to get it on an agenda. Bill, okay. are we allowed to use ARPA funds for what I would consider as somewhat of a maintenance kind of item. Yeah, we are now because because of the lost revenue. We can we can do it as lost revenue, right? Yeah, it's, but, but the the designation of lost revenue means that you're allowed to use up to ten million dollars of our funds right. and and just uh, consider it uh, as a revenue in your budgeting process. So. Yes, the answer is yes. That's what I thought. So when do we receive the rest of it, the other eight million? Keep your fingers crossed. Maybe get a date on we'll 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 Hopefully, we'll we'll receive the other seven hundred and seventy-five thousand in uh, September or October. But uh, and yeah. then the other eight mil next year. So. Don't worry. It's definitely coming. Get it. Um, discuss the net. Any other budget questions? Discussing our next meeting date? Yeah, so um, you're scheduled to meet on May 2nd. I think given that you have um, some interviews for the Planning Commission, you probably should. I'm just letting you know I'm going to be on vacation. I won't be here on May 2nd. Okay. And um, so you'll have to meet without me. So there'll be a Planning Commission interview, I hear third hand there might be a school board interview. Lisa probably knows more about that than I do, but I have been told directly <coughs> that there's a water in your face says you have something to say, Chris. No, I just, I may have a commitment myself as well. Okay. Um, it could be brief, it could be in Zoom. Sure okay. We can s just see what shakes out in the next couple of weeks. Okay, so we'll leave it on the calendar and then go from there. All right, last of the manager's items, update on wage and salary ranges. Uh, we put this under manager's items, but it was because it was requested. Correct. Um, and I think that there's uh, some of it will involve uh, evaluation of a public employee, so that is something that should be done in the executive session. I can't make a decision on the executive session, of course, but uh, I would recommend it go into executive session to do that. I have a motion. And if you, oh, you need the finding first. Motion, that's it. Okay. Um, I move to enter executive session to consider the evaluation of a public employee. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. And the select board gets to choose. We need to vote. Well, before you vote, the select board chooses who it wants in executive session. That should be part of your motion. Okay. So I would assume you want me. I don't know if you want anybody else. Carla doesn't I'm, want to stay. I'm going to put 
everybody here back in the waiting room. Okay. Yeah. Is there anything so they need to make a motion first. Well, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Wait a bit. Um, yeah, I would like for Nick to stay for the, that conversation as well. To invite him there. Kim. I don't know if it's worth, you know, certainly I want you here, Bill, to hear what this is all about. Um, but we could, I'm wondering if the board could have a session by ourselves maybe after you talk to us or that's a great idea either order whatever you think yeah. um, first like we discuss first and then you're gonna have to leave you're gonna, gonna, I can't hear anything you're gonna have to <laughs> talk first and then have or have Bill's input first. No, I think we to. need to hear from yeah. Bill first. Okay, perfect. Which, so then maybe. pleasure with me staying or going. I'm happy to go. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. so. <laughs> I can take minutes for once, but. You don't take minutes for once. Yeah. Does yeah. uh, somebody know how to let those people back in? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I will why, why take my computer. Coming back in? Nothing else. Well, we have to make. We have to make a decision. You can't right. predetermine. Right. So they're gonna. They're mm -hmm. in the waiting room oh, now. Oh, I have that motion. Um, well, we have, we have to, So I should amend it. I should have made it. So I'm withdrawing that motion. Um, or yeah. Or, yeah. So then we're saying I move to enter executive session to consider the evaluation of a public employee and to invite the municipal manager. And if we wanted to and change. and and um, the rec director. Rec 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 and then will we do another one after for if we wanted to ask others to leave the room? No, you just no, stay in the executive session and room. just kick people out. <laughs> okay. Out. okay. And just somebody write down what time you adjourn and let me know. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, so a second to the amended <laughs> motion. Yeah. Thank you. Chris okay, so seconded. Further discussion. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 So Excellent. I would I'm sorry. I would oh. suggest that 